sit back and relax as you listen to the Train Kickers podcast. I'm Dave, and along with my co-host Dan, and our special guest Steve, plan to take you all around the exciting world of Titanicus. On tonight's episode, we're going to continue our intro to Titan- Titanicus, and we're going to pick up where we left off on that topic last time. Now, on to the show. So I just wanted to pop in here and go over two rules that we had some disagreements about and that we are a little bit wrong on. So the first one I want to go over is Awaken the Machine Spirit. When you roll your reactor die, if you get the Awaken Machine Spirit, you're supposed to make a command test. If you pass it, you're fine. If you fail it, then you look on your table and and roll on the table for the Machine Spirit. We incorrectly stated that for your Princep Senioris, that he gets the plus two, much like on the when he's doing an order for that rule. He does not actually, if you look at the rules um, for the machine spirit, you don't get the plus. The plus two is only actually when doing an order. The other rule that went back and forth on was split fire. Um, Steve and I both had a much more strict interpretation of that rule, where Dan had a much more loose interpretation. And through just various discussions on, on different forums and all with people, it turns out that Dan's interpretation is correct. For whatever reason, both Steve and I just looked at it as being a lot more restrictive. Um, we don't really have a good reason why we thought it was so restrictive. We just kind of thought that it was. Um, but Dan was correct. So when you do split fire... You start by declaring your targets, so you could declare several Titans as your targets. And then you go through your normal steps 2 to 6 for shooting. Step 2 is you decide a weapon that you're going to fire, and then you go through the process of firing it. Then you repeat step 2 again later, which is choosing a weapon. Well, since you are allowed any of those as targets, when you're selecting the next weapon, you can select either of them or any of them to be the target of that weapon meaning that you could fire gatling cannon at a titan oh shields didn't go down okay well i'll fire my bellicosa at this other titan that is without shields so i um, just wanted to clear that up and now actually on to the show and how are you doing this evening dan hopefully with more voice than you had before it's only it's only <laughs> like three days past last recording so yeah, no, it's, no, my voice is actually pretty good. Um, I know. Yeah, no, it's just been it's been recovering, and thankfully, this is the last week we have until winter break. Of course, our district decided to go into the absolute end of the week, like Thursday, three o'clock Ooh. is when we end. Oh yeah, no, they're they not even half play. days. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, uh, that's funny. No, no, actually, no. So I- yeah, no. It's a- Thank correct, actually. We yeah. recorded early last week. I released late in the week. That's what it was. So you've had an extra week for your voice. Yeah, no, it's actually a lot better. Though. It should be a lot better. It should be a lot better. But yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. And for anyone who was um, listening to our other Titanicus episode, which if you didn't listen to that, stop this, go listen to that first. Otherwise, this won't really make that much sense. But if so, we have our, our friend Steve on again to discuss this. Hello, hello. How you doing, Steve? What's up? Doing all right. Relax. I have a nice cup of tea. And get ready to talk to Titanicus. Oh. That, that <laughs> Wait, what kind up? of tea? <laughs> Not just some basic chai tea. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't had chai tea in a while. Oh. That's, Probably help your voice a bit. That's true. No, I have a I have a I shouldn't be drinking it. I have the um my favorite tea is uh it's passion tea from Starbucks. It's like a mixture of like berries, which is probably not a good thing because it's got a lot of citrus in it. But um, that's yeah, bad for your voice. Yeah, no, but it, it's it's my like it's it's so good, <laughs> it's so good. Tea is very appropriate to sit and talk about a game by a bunch of British men. So I think that works well. All right. Um. So we'll we'll get into the the show proper. One uh one comment I want to bring up from the last episode now it's only a few days after that had been released but one of the comments we actually got from someone who had listened was um a little bit of of history that honestly i just don't i know i didn't see anywhere um this game was before i started when it originally came out i think it was before all of us sort of started at least in this branch of the hobby and we had talked about you know how titanicus kind of came out first then it was you know space marine all that rolled into epic and all and and what the what the gentleman mentioned was that the reason the game was really put in the plastic at that time and not metal or or like some of their specialist lines were because of blood bowl so apparently blood bowl at that point they had done and 
had, had come out and it was doing exceptionally well. And they said, okay, well, hey, for these specialist lines, we can put this in plastic and, you know, it's going to sell great for us. Because that's it's a big commitment to to kind of go into plastic. So I was not aware of that, though. That sounds actually bad. I didn't know that at all. Yeah, he was mentioning it. Um, he, and he, he went through, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but he went through a little bit of the extra all about it. Um, so I, I, I thought that was interesting. Because again, I looking through to do our research, I found different things. But that kind of stuff I just wasn't able to find all of. It's kind of hard to find things that don't purely come from GW. And they're not necessarily the best person to uh, to discuss it. Um, I, uh, actually, I'll, I, I pulled it up. Here, here's what he said. Um, it got put into plastic because of how well Blood Bowl did, not just because of the interest at conventions. After how well 28 more millimeter Warlords sold, they knew they were going to have a lot of sales for the small ones that they then did, and that helps them switch the plastic production. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I thought oh, that was nice. interesting. 2018 is plastic. Uh, interesting. I like that a lot. Mm. Okay. More you know, I guess. Thank, thank you, Blood Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Blood Bowl. I I'll take it. Although now it Shit. gets more and more uh, resin, unfortunately, as we go along. At least specialized into resin, but that that's still yeah. better than metal. Oh. Yeah, still better. Oh my god. My my infinity is all metal. metal. My entire tiered army is all mm. second edition metal models. I probably have some lead poisoning. I got oh, a soft definitely. shot for them. They're a pain to build. But I think I talk, we, good in your we we talked about I talked about this specifically with Infinity when we did our Infinity yep. one, um, where I was like, I love Infinity, I love the gameplay, I love everything, but it was just yep. metal models are my biggest gripe with it. I cannot stand metal models. That's why my it's, Infinity has not been painted yet. Yeah. Um. But yeah. By the way, Dave, have you been doing anything? Have you been a uh, hobbying at all um yeah so earlier today i finished up another squad of gut rippers so now i have three squads um one with red shields one with yellow shields one with blue shields because you got to distinguish them somehow <laughs> that's um, what i did <laughs> i finished the basing on them and 20 hobgrots so now every one of them is based everything that's done is now fully based and ready to go i still have another uh three pack of bolt boys that are almost done i've just got to do like highlights and everything like that on them then they're done once that's done, I just got to assemble um, uh, Big Bird. Um, the, uh, I can't Ooh. remember the dude's name. Prophet of Oh, the crow, the crow. Yeah, the crow, the crow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like, um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I am, when I look at it, I, I would love to paint it up. Now, it, its head is very vulture-like and all. So, like, you need a certain scheme to make that look well and all. Although, I do kind of want to paint him up as just a giant parrot. But he's he's gonna look Do weird. It. It's probably not gonna work well. But I think that would just be funny. Oh, Gobsprack. That's it. That's his name. Okay. I would um, say do it. That's awesome. Yeah. The problem is head's a little weird. Um, there's two heads in there. Um, because it's a multi-purpose kit. You either have Gobsprack sitting on the back, or you just have like a boss sitting on the back. I'm gonna magnetize that the same way I did my swamp boss. Um, okay. that way I can Makes run sense. either option. But you need to. I mean, there's no way I'm buying an extra one of those kits. Uh, the, the, the swamp boss there's a there's a chance the sludge trigger beast maybe i could i could see wanting to i don't think i do but i could see it for this big one no 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 chance i'd want another one. so okay. i got a man though you did more than i did oh no I, I, did. I did a little more because i i count buying yeah. things as hobby i think it should count well i did buy well before i talk with this, steve what'd you do this week right, or since so we last talked so I've been working on two things. On one end, I got a little bit of uh, shit from some of the guys in my Titanicus group. They're like, you know, why are models always falling apart, Steve? Why don't you just glue them? Um, so I'm finally finishing my models, going back, repainting armor panels to the quality I want them to be, instead of just being spray painted the base color I want the armor to be. But more interestingly, I've been working on some custom weapon options for Titanicus. Um, so basically my idea is I want to fill in the gaps in the logical scale of weapons, I guess, and bring in some stuff that we haven't seen before. Um, so the most basic level, um, Warhound missile launchers, it was a thing way back in the old days of Titanicus. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Dan was telling me something about that before. And there's kind of clues hidden in other weapon profiles that there should be a Warhound missile launcher. 
So I played a game with a quick um, stat mockup for that. Really changed the way the model worked. I enjoyed it. And then I started working on a sonic cannon that fits onto the Warbringer um, based on the Ordinatus weapon, um, lore-wise. Rules-wise, it does some really weird stuff. Um, should you want me to dig into that, or should I just kind of leave it nebulous right. like that? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. All right, so to break it down to what it actual effects are, it shoots a beam of sonic energy, and it hits larger targets harder in the lore. And I tried to translate that over to mechanics. Um, there's a couple of rules I pulled to bring to this purpose. Um, first of all, we have beam. Um, it's one of the weird rules they added after the core rulebook came out, but if you have the Loyalist Legios and Traitor Legios, it's in there. Um, basically, just draw a line from your base to the full range of the weapon. One million or wide, everything under that line is potentially getting hit by the weapon. The first thing that gets hit gets hit with the full force, and the next thing gets hit slightly less, and so on. Um, so that's a really cool effect. So if you kill something, it's going to keep killing things. And then after that, to represent it hitting larger targets harder, it has a low base strength. Well, somewhat low, you know, medium level. But it gets um, to roll a d10 do damage instead of a d6 if you're at that short range. Um, basically, I stole the rule off of the melted weapons and gave it to this giant beam weapon. Because um, what that does is, mechanically, it gives knights a good save against the weapon. They're less likely to take serious damage, but then if a titan gets hit, they could it be in serious more. trouble. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I played with it. It felt different. It felt cool. Like it, it definitely had a certain weight about it on the table. My opponent was freaked out by it. And I was able to get a good shot lined up, and I took out two warhounds with it. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty brutal. Granted, one of them helped by falling into the other one and taking out a lot of structure. But, yeah, it, it definitely had an impact. So that was the point of, you know, tweaking this, you know, how many dice does it get to attack with, what's its strength, and what's its point, and once that's all worked out, uh, damn, got some stuff coming your way. <laughs> nice. <laughs> of course, more to paint, damn it. Um, no, no, no. Uh, what would you say, um, for, for trying to make your own custom stuff, what are you finding is the most difficult part of that? Is it trying to get a reasonable balance? Is it trying to figure out how many points to put this thing at? So, I feel like in Titanicus, the points, while they're there, they're not the ultimate balance point of the game. Mm. The balance of the game comes from everything fitting into its role. Um, some weapons, you know, they're good at knocking off shields. Some weapons are good at just doing wholesale, I'm going to smack some location really hard, strip off all its armor plating, and then something else could come along and finish off that spot, right? So when you're designing a new weapon, you want to make sure that it doesn't hit all the markers. It has to have some sort of downside and some sort of upside. Okay. Um, so for the Sonic Cannon, originally I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to make this thing like dice, you know, three or four, and it's going to do this, it's going to do that. And I looked at it, I'm like, this is really cool, but it does way too much to the point where it turns the game into something about the weapon instead of the weapon fitting into the existing ecosystem of the game. So, all right, so I got to, you know, find the niche that this could fill without overshadowing something that exists. Because um, even if you make a weapon expensive, you know, even if I, you know, say a weapon typically costs between 30 and 50 points, depends on the size of the weapon. But let's use this as a marker. Right? I, that, that's a fair spot to start yeah. at, yeah. Right? Absolutely. If, even if I made the weapon 100 points, it's still going on a model that's, 300 point so a 100 point weapon isn't that much of a jump compared to what it could do on the table like sure. the points guide the balance and help level it up but weapon points don't really drive the balance of the game i feel so it's definitely in getting the stats to fit into that niche you can't have too no, many yeah oh yeah that yeah makes sense everyone wants to have their you know custom model do everything but then it kind of breaks the game you know got to fit it within the realm of what the models already exist exactly like 
Like, if you had a weapon that was a high strength, high dice value, and blast, oh my gosh, that would be... Yeah, exactly. It ruins Ooh. it. Well, that's why we were, you were talking about the missiles, right? The missiles you strapped on your war hound. Um, the war master has its, uh, sh- not shoulder, its armpit gun missiles, which are, like, they're not warlord size, and they're definitely not reaver size. They're warhound sized and i think i sent you that old catalog picture of the warhound and one of the warhound weapons back in the day was missile pods hell yeah it definitely changed the feel of the model too like i was playing with that thing totally differently than the rest of the list um for context people who do play the game i was running an arcus maniple um for that match and having a warhound in the back just plinking away shields did a lot even though it wasn't spotting for the Warbringer, did a lot just to soften up targets for that big cannon hit to follow up. Um, I played it at dice four, because some people I was chatting with, ah, you know, dice three is not very impactful. I think dice four was too much, so it's going to be dropped down to dice three. Um, and again, that's that's what the Warmaster has. It's it's dice yep. three in the shoot. Yeah, so it's literally, you just replicate, just rip it out of the Warmaster. Exactly, and that you know that helps a lot too with weapon design, where you're just moving things from one titan to the next. Um, the missiles, I took the Warmaster shoulders, just moved it onto Warhound. Um, another one I have, I haven't tested it yet, but it really shouldn't need that much tweaking. Is taking the Warlord Volkite Destructor and strapping that onto a Warbringer. Oh um, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. I love my giant Choon cannons, so once that gets working, oh, yeah. I'm gonna have fun with that. Volkite is the coolest looking. It may not be impact. Uh, no, no, I, no. It's good. It's a good gun. <laughs> oh, that's different. You used to talk about how uh, it didn't look very good. Wait, Volkite? No, Volkite always looked good for me. Okay. Um, I, I, no, no. I fell in love with Volkite because of um, 30k. I played uh, I played uh, Myrmidons, Myrmidon Destructors. These are basically yeah. what what became Obliterators uh, when the tech virus hit. Um, but you could take uh, them with the big boy Volkrite, which is a uh, strength. Someone correct me. Strength six or shots. Seven, like yeah, that. the point is they wound really marines on twos, yeah. right? They hit on twos and wound marines on twos, but they get to reroll ones and they hit in the wound. So I had like a squad of five, and they just put out freaking twenty shots, hitting on twos, Oops. wounding on twos. Um, but they don't like like they don't just they don't have AP anything. It's just you just put. The amount of armor saves on something is ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, anyway, you roll enough. That's going on the fail. <laughs> Oh yeah. Very cool. <sighs> so, so that's what you've been working on the last while, Steve. Just that sort of stuff. Just trying to homebrew your yeah, own stuff. Exactly, because in the oh, league, I kind of have a little like lore thing going on, um, where you know they're on this planet. Why are they all on this planet? It was the start of the heresy. I'm like, well, maybe they're, you know, the reason we have eight different Titan Legios showing up here is because we're doing a big weapon show. Like, look at what the tech priest dreamt up. Let's watch these new weapons in action. And then, oh, wait, mm-hmm. we're pointing those at other Titans. I like that. And that kind of kicks off the whole conflict. Very nice. I will, right. um, I will mention the last thing before uh, before Dan went uh, out of the way there. So in terms of, like I said, I count purchasing. So for whatever reason, we decided that we're going to start playing some Star Wars Legion again. Uh, some of us have played it in the past. Some have never touched the game before. At some point, we'll talk about that as well once I have a... Honestly, it's been years since I've played it. Once I have a better footing on that. But we decided then, so I decided to go Separatist, which Dan, like I said, I have some imps or rebels if you want. I'll just hand them to you. Don't do it. I don't even care. I want Wookiees. No, I want Wookiees. Wookiees I don't have, but they have a bunch of stuff for them. I said they just came out with their uh, Fluttercraft. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Um, But I, I picked up some Separatist stuff. So I got like some, I got some of the Magna Guard. I got a spider droid and they're... Their transport vehicle. What's it called? The uh, tank droid. The persuader. Uh, p- sorry, persuader class tank droid. So I thought I was going to be able to spend today, get those assembled, everything else. But uh, I had a work project that I had to do that I've been avoiding the whole semester. So I haven't done any of that stuff that I thought I'd actually be able to do today. So once finals are over, 
I sit down and actually work on all that. Try to get it done in time good, so we can try using it. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. So now, now, now getting what, what, have, what have you done? I saw that you bought some stuff, some stuff that you tried to get me to get you at yeah. PAX, but they're out of. Yeah. So I tried to buy it on Saturday, um, but I did not know that the hall closes at six. I got flipped out when yeah. that huge siren came out. I was like, what the fuck? Um, no, no. I, I finally caved. Um, Okay, so with custodies, uh, I've always said that they're they're kind of like they're models I will not buy, will not purchase. So I hate the look of them. Uh, it's definitely the dick bikes. Those are the Agamatis. I absolutely hate them. My friend has them. I tried to like them, but they just looked awful. They they're so bad. Um, the Coronis is the troop transport. I don't like it. The thing is, it's it's massive. Like it it, it you could fit like three on a table. They're, they're huge. They're bane blade size essentially. Wow. But I did cave. Yeah, no, they're. I didn't think they'd be that big, but I uh, one of my friends had it, brought it in. It's it's like bigger than a Spartan tank, and that gives like for some of the thirty k people who listen for it's bigger than a Spartan tank. It's about the size of a bane blade. It's it's insane. Um, for holding holding six custodians, and it's not a great tank. So, little side note: the reason I don't get it is I don't like the look. It's too big, but also it's 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 useless. Um, it's not in the, so, you know, you would use it in 30 K 40 K it's too many points. Uh, don't even use it, but 30 K you would think, all right, custodians want to be in close combat, a Spartan art assault tanks, you know, they can come out and assault and attack a close combat. It's not an assault tank. So I come out of the tank and they're just sitting there for a turn. So I'd rather, I'd rather just deep strike, which is what I normally do anyway. That's and I, I, I mean, it's points. To, yeah. That sounds like an oversight. It always has been, but you know, Custodes got the new book. I think that was book eight. They got updated rules, and it still wasn't an assault vehicle. And so, no one ever uses it because that's literally like why you would take it. You would want to assault, yeah. and it's it, it, the hatch is at the rear, so it's not like you can assault out the front. Um, but still, you want it to be an assault vehicle. It's just you sit there for a turn, which is fine. But I'd rather just deep strike, and because what is it? It's like it's it's Spartan point cost it's like 300 points 250 to 300 points um for reference it's five points to give my each model a teleportation device so in a squad of five that's 25 points so <laughs> i have to you know what i mean like it just saves points to yeah. deep strike now that comes with more hazards but i'd still rather do that no, cause um, no glory yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> and also deep striking just sounds more fluffy too um so um I built some Alaris and Sisters because I finally I'm waiting for the Shadow Throne box, uh, so that'll bring that'll bring me to what I need. Um, and yeah, I, th- I bought three Caladius, which are the uh, gun tanks. They're like uh, Sakarans but floaty, so they're, they're basically anti. You could they can come with two turrets, um, and they come with an anti tank laser turret essentially, or um, a uh, rapid fire auto cannon is the best way to describe it. It's basically good for hitting uh, skimmers out of the sky or light tanks. But it's, it, it actually does look cool. I did fall in love with it after seeing it like live, and I saw how cool it looked. Um, but no to the dick bikes. <sighs> the next purchase might be the Coronis, just because I kind of want to have one just for funsies. But <sighs> ne- definitely never the dick bikes. Um, and then... I don't know, maybe the flyers eventually, like the big, big, big flyers they come with. But I, I was talking about this with the group of 30K guys. I'd rather purchase a Thunderhawk. Custodes can't take them, but I would rather, I wish Custodes could take Thunderhawks because that, that would be an immediate purchase instantly. That'd be like my birthday purchase because I, uh, I love the way the Thunderhawks. That would be a lot of work to put that together, build and yes. everything like that. Yes, but that's a good project to hold me over. <laughs> I, I've, um, Oh, it was quite a while ago. I was listening to, um, um, I think it was an independent character or something like that. They had someone there discussing you know, Forge World, how to deal with it, how to put it together, all of that. And they were talking about from that kit. And I want to say it was the following episode. They said, you know, they had the guy back on for a bit. And they're like, hey, we, j- we just want to make sure we didn't scare people away from Forge World. When he talked about the things he did, like essentially putting a little bit of a skeleton in it. Because when you support it on its base, that way you don't warp the um, warp the back and all, because it's too much weight on it and all that kind of stuff like that. Oh, thanks. Know. Yeah. No, it Forge World comes with, and that's also why I kind of stay away from the big boy flyers because I don't like doing that rod. I know uh, my, our friend Brett has the rod. Um, kind of have to. 
Yeah, I just, it's weird for me. But anyway, like I said, caved finally, and I did buy the Caladius, which I think does look cool. I'll give because it's it's not massive. It's big enough that it looks floaty, but it's not big enough that it's like takes up a third of the damn table, like the Coronas, you know. And you bought actual Caladius, or is this from nefarious actual, regions? No, no, no. This is this is actual Caladius this time. Um, actual Caladius. Um, I will say though, in all honesty, um, because they don't sell the top turrets separately, I am nefariously printing, or I shouldn't say printing. Someone is printing for me the uh, the alternative turret because it swaps same chassis, different turret. So that way I don't buy six tanks, you know what I mean? I think that that's oh. stupid, yeah. So it's like two different boxes? Yeah, so it, you can buy the Caladius with the Annihilator gun, or you can buy the Caladius with the Accelerator gun. It's the same body, um, but it's two separate tops to the gun. So it's two separate um, kits, and they don't like put the other sprue in. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you played 40k, right? So, yeah. uh, you know... um, like you know how you have the predator with the last cannon and also the uh, auto cannon top. Yeah. You can build both in the same box. This is not that. It's like they gave you an auto cannon predator, or you could buy a last cannon predator. It's two different kits, same body, two different guns. Oh, that that's really shitty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Actually, there's no nice way to put it. Oh, that's it, just super shitty of them to do. No, it is. It, no, it is. It is shitty. Build it without a gun to just be an extra rhino. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's it's. Yeah, so I did find nefariously other places to metal uh, resin uh, or, or cast the uh, top turret, and not for much, not for much. So I think it was like fifteen. Yeah, fifty. I'm looking at it now, fifteen bucks for the top turret, um, which is not bad because the model itself is like a hundred twenty, hundred forty. It is a big model. It is a chunk of resin, but um, for fifteen bucks, so fifteen, fifty, forty-five, fifty bucks. I'll say with tax, I get the other three turrets, and I could swap them. Magnets, not bad. I don't mind that at all. That's definitely better than buying yeah, no. it, but that's uh, that's a problem with just the yeah, way GW is doing it. Yeah, it, they, this it, this happens with custodies a lot, but it's again nothing you can do. I find it happens with anything that's what I would call not necessarily specialist game or closer to a specialist game, because you get the same thing in Titanicus where. You know, here here is this Reaver kit. It comes with these options. Here is this other kit. It comes with the other options. They'll sell you the sprue yeah. separately. They, they did start doing that after a while. But you don't get every option in one of them. Even all the options that are in yeah. plastic. No, it makes sense. But yeah, no, it's, it's like I said, been doing good. I'll wait for that to come in. That should be fun to paint. I also ordered some extra custodies um, transfers as a just in case. I try to find a store. We'll talk about this later because I, I wanted to start a store. So I did try to pick up a store transfers, but those are sold out absolutely everywhere. So good luck. I don't know where I'm going to find those. Have to, well, you might have to. I mean, you could always ask around any of the Reddit groups or the Facebook groups. There might be someone who has a couple spare yeah. transfers or something. A lot of other people do the same thing you did where it's like, oh, let me get up all these transfers while I can. Then they find out they got a lot more than they'll ever use. Yep. <laughs> got that for Volpa transfers. Oh, no, I never get through half of them. Got like four kits of those things. But All right, that seems like that's a, a good amount of, of hobby. And also, we're going to save um, games played till the end. One, I don't know if many of us have played too much that wasn't Titanicus. And since we're kind of theming towards that, we'll stick a little bit closer to it. But also, we figure we should probably go a little bit more through the game itself and discuss it and all before we start talking about some of the nitty-gritty of... Um, of of some games that they've been playing. All right, so we'll get back to it, back to where we had left off. And it looks like the the first thing that we kind of put down was a little bit more of how to actually put your army together. So yes, who, so I think yeah, it's, go ahead. Start yeah, it so I thought this was a good start because we mentioned this in the last podcast. But um, I definitely want to go into more detail, especially since this is like episode two. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, someone listening is like, you know what? I want to play Titanicus. You know, let's, you know, what do I need to start? What do I, so I kind of wanted to start with this because this is actually what happens before the game. Like, this is not the gameplay. This is, this is something that you actually have to do before the game. And it literally modifies everything you do. Um, it, it's it, hard to, because people are, yeah, go ahead. It, it, and it's what you should think about before you truly get into your game. You know, yes. in 
you know, we're all people with different jobs, different socioeconomic backgrounds and all, but it's unrealistic to believe that like, oh, I'm going to get into this game. I'm just going to get whatever they have out. No, you're probably in the beginning, build towards a list, build towards a theme, build towards something in particular. Exactly. So if you can figure out your avenue before you start, then you can make sure any of your purchases that you make are well-informed and useful. The last thing you want is like, oh, there's two different boxes. I bought this box. Oh, the thing I want to do, like we don't we don't really use yeah. that Titan. Because some, some of these either lead you through their rules or through maybe stratagems or, or that you want to use or through um anything else that you do you might not even use certain types they might not mean the ones that you want well it's funny because one of the <laughs> i remember this when i first started titanic is uh, one of the biggest complaints was oh it's just loyalist versus trader it's imperium versus imperium where's the variety um yeah. and i kind of laugh at that now um it's, it's like yeah, technically it's Imperium versus Imperium, but between just going down the just going down whatever, just like just between choosing Titan and Knight, uh, Legio, Trader, uh, Trader Loyalist, Stratagems, Maniple, like it, you vary your forces drastically. Um, so it's just really cool that there's that level of variety, you know. Anyway, that's just me. So. I mean, let's start with this. The first thing you do is you, and this, I know Steve talked about this. Now, I've never done this. I think Steve has, but I'll ask him. You either choose, you either want a tight, or, Titan army with like a knight support, so they just support, or do you want a knight house army? So this is your first choice. Um, mm -hmm. Steve, have you ever run like a knight house army? Because I've never done that. I did it once, and um, two of the guys in the league are doing it, so I had to you know, refresh myself on it. It is very cumbersome to write a knight-based army because there's so many restrictions boxing you in. So the basic building block of a knight army is the, I guess, the lance, right? So yeah. a lance yeah. of knights is the equivalent of a maniple of titans. It is always three units of knights. And of those three... Two of them have to be the same base chassis. So it could be like a squad of Questorus knights, you know, all armed with bow cannons and chain swords. And then, a, uh, what is that, the Paladin? Yeah, that's the Paladin. For those who follow the like, 40k, 30k version of knights. Um, and then you have another squad of all Erics with the Melta cannons and the Power Fist or chain swords. And those are the same chassis, because both Questorus knights. And then for your third unit in the lance, you do something else. You could do a uh, lancer unit. You could do, now that we release them, you could do an armager unit up to one per lance. Or uh, one of the four drill knights, like the, um, the Styrix or the Megara or the, like, you know the term, Atchiko. Yeah, that's a press. But the hard part in writing a knight list is that each banner, which is like your squad of knights, has to be armed identically through the unit. Mm -hmm. So when you pick a box of Questorus that has one Melta, one Battle Cannon, one Gatling Cannon, that's not going to give you a legal unit. Unless it's your overall army leader's unit. So list writing on knights is very difficult. Then um, I'm going to catch some flack for this. I'm going to catch flack, but I'm going to say the game is called Titanic. It's for a reason. Um, knight armies are fun. They're great, but it's just, I don't know. It's still called Titanic. It's just play Titans. <laughs> yeah, you tell them, Dan. <laughs> like, I, know, I know it's very divisive, and that's kind of gatekeepy a little bit, but I should, this makes time to be robots. Come on. Come they, on. Came, they came out with it because they had made some knights, and they're like, well... Honestly, I think to a large extent, they said some people just want these little boys and we could sell them a book. So yeah, let's, let's give them yeah. an ability to play. If you don't play yeah. with enough terrain, if you, if you don't play with an understanding with your opponent that you're going to bring an army of knights, you as an also with good terrain, all that. But if there's not that understanding first, it's going to be a bad game. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's no, very, no. it just, it changes. It, it's, I don't know. Titanic, up. You get, I don't want to say a fair game with all Titans. You can get a fair game you with get a fair as well. Game. But it, yeah, but it's, it, it is. It is a, a fair skew. game. Yeah, it's a skew. Yeah. Well, it's Which a, sucks, but yeah. 
you, you, you bring these you bring these little little ones so you, your, your bigger titans have void shields things like that so you know you you put your giant weapon you know hits my void shield all right i i, I took one hit on it i roll a die maybe i lose one void shield you know if it gets to my body if i no longer have void shields now you're doing some damage to me but you know on your single hit assuming your titan isn't horrendously damaged your single hit it might hurt me badly but i'm i'm not out of the game it's not all over at that point you have your you know your volcano can something like that you you hit a unit of knights if i roll well they're gone just get rid of all of them yeah yep. or if i scatter well and i hit them in a, in a spot where i couldn't see them then I, I take out a unit of uh, lancers coming in. Right, Dan? Yeah. Or yep. even a quake cannon. Like a quake cannon will literally. <laughs> no- you, you, you take. You take- <laughs> I'm trying I to ignore you what you just said. Did you? Yeah, no, there I it do. is. Oh, I, I was remember. For that recognition. I, was to ign- I was trying to ignore it, but to no, what Dave is you. referencing is literally his volcano. I think it literally scattered 10 inches. I think Shoots it was actually volcano. our first game we ever played as well. So yeah, the same time. Uh, fucking the fucking things. So we'll talk about scattered ice, but it scatters ten inches away from it. It's intended target. Eeks around the goddamn building and hits an entirely hidden night banner, just decimates them. And I'm just like, oh my fucking god! It was just, oh, I was so bad. Sixty no scope. I'm sure you're, you uh, you're I was so bad. Um, but even like a quake cannon. I always now I always take a quake cannon just in case someone takes knights, but it's also a good weapon, period, to take as a just in case. But I take a quake cannon. Oh, you have your Porphyrian knight on first fi- or uh, on first fire, so now he hits on threes. Fuck you, take a quake cannon. Now he hits on fives. Um, it's just it, it's too much of a skew army in my opinion. But again, you could choose knight or you can choose titan, and this again you could see that already that changes the game entirely, which then brings me like the next thing, which again I don't play like. Well, I play. I want to play one of these. I don't play another one. Right. So that you can, cho- you have to choose your uh, act, not action. Uh, I guess action? allegiance. Allegiance. Thank you. Yeah. You, have to choose, you have to choose your allegiance. You can be a loyalist, scum. Uh, you could be, <laughs> or you could be a black shield. So I play traitor, uh, but I will be playing loyalist eventually. Um, and w- what this does is. Um, it literally, again, drastically changes the way you play. Now, Legio and Trader. Oh, sorry, you also have Black Shield. So before I even get into that, what the hell is a Black Shield? Because I actually didn't know this. Believe yeah, it or I not, I must, I must. Yeah, I must. Um, I have the book. <laughs> so Black Shields, they first dig into it in uh, the Defense of Ryza. Um, if you got your campaign books handy, but basically they are the Titan Legios that don't really pick a side in the war, right? Either they're like, listen, this is between, you know, you Horus lovers, you Emperor lovers, you could figure this out. Like, uh, Legio Zestiobax would probably okay. be classified as a Black Shield. Um, for those who don't know, Zestiobax is um, this Legio painted purple and white. They were at the um, Burning of Prospero, and they were caught off guard. They were just kind of there, and they got attacked by uh, the forces of the Emperor, I guess you could call them that. Strong word for any space wolf, but, you know. Um, Slogan <laughs> the Emperor attacked Prospero because Magnus did nothing wrong, and they have to punish him for it. Um, Legio Zestiobax has strong tithe with the Thousand Sons, because they also like psychic stuff a little bit. Um, so, you know, they're just chilling on the planet. Um, the um, Space Wolves the um, custodians and a little bit of Sons of Horus all show up along with support from the Joe Mortis. It's like, you know, they're going through, they're taking out a thousand sons. And as part of this battle, Zestiobax is there. They get targeted by the Mortis Titans. They fight back. But Zestiobax doesn't really take part in the rest of the heresy. And since they didn't attack loyalists, they didn't attack traitors, they just kind of stayed out of the thing. They would be falling to Black Shield categories. They're just kind of watching out for themselves, right? Or Swords for Hire style. It could be like, listen, if you're willing to give me munitions, I'm going to fight on your side for this battle. Things like that. So, kind of piratey, kind of pacifisty, kind of screw everything up, carving out my own empire. Like anything in that range. All right. So, then I'm going to ask you a question. Well, I'll ask the question after I say this because I'm actually now kind of really stupid curious. Um, <laughs> So um, I know that if you choose loyalist or traitor, so 
we'll get to this a little bit, you know, we'll talk about stratagems later, which basically are, um, they, you know, they pop up during the game, they can modify or help you, whatever, so on and so forth. But I know Loyalist and Traitor get access to the same stratagems, but then they also have Loyalist stratagems and Traitor stratagems. Loyalists have the Desperate Measures category, and Traitors have the Warp uh, category. Um, you know, they basically do nasty shit. Do Black Shields have, like, a stratagem category, or is it just they use the normal rulebook so ones? They- they don't have their own set of stratagems yet, but they do have their own allegiance ability. Um, so for loyalists, you know, once again, they could change their order. Um, I forget the traitor one, but the black shield one is that once per game, if you have a titan that's not inside the maniple and you fail your order, which would normally end your sequence of giving out orders, mm-hmm. one titan not inside a maniple can still get an order because it's a decentralized command. You don't have that rigid oh, hierarchy cool. pushing down on you saying, you know, this is your process. Okay. If you don't follow their instructions, yeah. big bad on you. It's, I'm going to do my own thing because, you know, we're all free spirited and such. And yeah, that's actually cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like that. That's um, a nice one. Yeah, that, that's nice. Yeah. Which then brings me to, okay, so you're Loyalist Trader Black Shield. Now, you don't have to choose this, but you, some people, most people do. Then you choose your Legio, or if you're a Titan Army, your Titan House. Um, but you choose your Legio or your Titan House. So there are benefits and there are co- pros and cons to this. Um, you know, you can choose to just be a plain Legio. And as you heard Steve say, you get a plain ability for Loyalist Trader or Black Shield. Or you choose one of the Legios. Um, and there are... And I, I don't even think I counted for this. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna... <laughs> Hold on, wait. Just I have my trader book in front of me here. Give me... Uh, but yeah, no, you, you choose, and this drastically changes how you play. This, this 16 will, loyalists. Yeah. I think it's about the same as traders. Might be more. 16, yeah. 16 different trader legions. Yep. Okay. And that's not even including the trader, that's not including the trader houses, of oh, night houses. I just counted the legions. Yeah. 16 yeah. trader legions, which is insane. Which again, this sounds weird. People are like, oh, it's just Imperium versus Imperium. But there are 16 trader legions, and also, hopefully, I think, 16 loyalist legions. Yep. That that's 30. thirty-two, and they and I'm not joking. We will talk about this much later in another episode when we go into like deep depths. But playing a legio will absolutely dramatically, for Christ's sake, uh, what's the stupid legio that only takes warhounds? I don't think they're a traitor. I, th- I want to say they're Audax. a loyalist. Audax, yeah. yeah. If you take legio Audax, oh, they are traitors. Yeah. If you take legio Audax, you don't take any other titan but warhounds. <laughs> That's like that's what you play. So it's just cool that it literally will completely change. It's like almost like playing a, a different army. Um, and I mean, when you choose your legio, you also get access to certain war gear that is specific to your legio. Maybe a certain strat. Not all have this, by the way. Um, certain stratagem or stratagems that are uh, to your legio. Um, I know some I have like special abilities. Yeah. 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 So and some some of them don't have like some have no war gear. Some have no stratagems. They just have all weird gear or all stratagems. So it's really cool that all of them are modified like that. Um, and some change what you're even allowed to bring to a game. Like, on top of the restrictions that uh, the all Warhound one, the Audax gets, yes. um, as a Grafonicus player, I could replace any Warhound or Warlord Titan in a manacle and go, ah, you know what? I want a Reaver there instead. So I could take the normal rules of the spell and say, I'm going to ignore those. I'm going to do my own thing. Um, which were the ones that got hunted down to all's extinction? Legio, um, what was the all female? That was the all female one, right? Which one? That was the all female one, right? The Grafonicus? loyalist. All- no, 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 no. The one that got hunted. Um, I want to say that was the one that was getting hunted by Mortis and Furion. That's they were all females. Fortis. Legio Wait, Fortis. Fortis. Yeah. Um, basically, their th- rule is they could take any one kind of Titan in a manacle and replace it with another one. And until a recent FAQ, they counted as that one, which was really breaking the way some stuff works. Yeah, it was. Yes. They clarified <laughs> it, polished it, made it less game-breaking. Um, getting free attacks oh. to the Warlord was a little bit much. Yes. <laughs> uh, that was the... But, uh, yeah, arc, like, the yeah. Yeah. So, what's really cool is that your Legio could really change how you write a list. Even yes. beyond four years. What models? <laughs> which, 
which you also mentioned the word because then once you choose your Legio or Titan house, you now choose your Maniple. And you're forced to play with a Maniple. It's one of the very few restrictions in Dynetics. You must take a Maniple in your art, mm-hmm. in your game. Uh, and then you could add any other support that you want. Um, but even the Maniple itself will modify how you play. So, for example, um, one of my two favorite Maniples of all time. Uh, actually, looks like my first favorite Maniple is Regia Maniple. Which is basically oh. the king and queen. Ma- yeah, I know. I heard the oh no over here. Uh, Regia mm-hmm. Maniple is essentially two warlords and two to four warhounds. And that's how you can modify it, by the way. That's how it gets modified. Um, and essentially, uh, the two warlords all of a sudden now have a rule where they could share their, sh- their, share their command. But the warhounds within three inches can share their shields. We'll talk about this later in gameplay. But essentially, normally you're supposed to share shields within base to base. Now I can share shields within three inches of each other with a warhound. So it gives them now extra protection, essentially, is what it is. Um, and that's just the region medical. And then my other favorite one is, I want to say it's Arcus. What's the one where the Warbringer uh, gets free shots? Is that the Arcus? Blindfire? Yeah, they get blind fire. I should have said sorry. Yeah, it, it's that's Arcus. Yeah. That's the Arcus. Yep. And yeah, it's Arcus. Arcus is one of my favorites because all of a sudden, the Warhound, it's Warhounds and Warbringers, and the Warbringer doesn't need line of sight to fire. Now you might be saying, "Well, that sucks. It's gonna, you know, hurt your ability to hit, right?" But this is again goes back to how the Legions kind of change how you play. Legio Furion has a very special ability, War Gear for twenty five points, which is a lot. But I can ignore up to one negative one while I shoot, so that I can behind be behind an entire building. You can't see me, and instead of hitting you on fives, I hit you on fours, which is massive. Anyway, that's just mandibles. I don't know. What are your favorite mandibles, Steve, Dave? I, I love the Ferox. Oh, of course I you was, do. Uh, so yeah, I was going to go with yeah. the same. So the idea of the Ferox is it's an up-close, brawling um, manacle. They have this rule called Knife Fighters, which basically says that you could use whatever skill you want when attacking, weapon skill or ballistic skill. Mm-hmm. So you're going to use the better of the two at any range you're fighting at. And if you're fighting up close to your opponent and you're like basically under their shadow, um, you get a bonus to do damage against them. And use my favorite model, the Reaver, along with some Warhounds, but I play Griffonagus, so I just load up on Reaver Titans, because I can do that. And I just run up and I mess things up up close. And Steve, you also use the... I've seen you use the Maniple with all the Reavers, the one where they just kind of swiggity swiggity and go any direction they want. I'm trying okay. to remember the name. Nah, that's the... Um, I was just looking at it, too. Yeah, I have, the, uh, I have that... Uh... Damn it, hold on. Corsair. Corsair, Corsair there it yes. is. You have the book open to all Corsair? this just going I'm between pages. Corsair, because I don't need the Corsair to get triple Reavers as my maniple. Oh, that's right, because again, you play the lead. And this no. is what we're talking about. See, there we go. <laughs> it, it literally changes the way you play. Uh, Dave, what about you? No, I think it is Ferox. Um, cause the, the, so I play Volpa. The big thing with them is that when we get close to you, th- they changed it. Now it's within five inches. I forget the exact rule before, but essentially when you were within melee, which um, in the game, you know, essentially is two inches. Um, it was you use your weapon skill goes up by one. So it's one barrier. Bliss skill gets worse. So we had better weapon skill. Well, Ferox, again, when you're within your um distance of how tall you are you get plus one to it and you can use either one within two inches that part doesn't make a difference using blizzard skill weapon skill within two but getting the plus one on armor rolls when i'm already there for um better at hitting always kind of worked well and plus it, it worked well for what i own um some of the other ones i like to look up i just don't have enough titans for some of the other ones um, whenever I actually do get my uh, Warbringer up and running, there's a few that look good with that, but I just don't have that one done yet. I've um, been very bad about painting some of these things. How dare you? Gonna ask, as someone <laughs> yeah. who loves the idea of melee fighting on Titans, yep. do you take your Legion-specific war gear, the Disruption Emitter, very often? Is it the new one? I, I didn't like, even see what they changed. No, because before basically. it was like... Yeah, that's one of the old ones. They've always had this one. Are they going to mm. the points? No, I don't think I... 
I honestly don't think I ever ended up taking the disruption emitter. So usually what I found, especially when I would run Ferox, what I would do is um, for pure melee, it would be one of my reavers. Um, for the rest of it, it would essentially be geared out for fighting, but I would usually take at least a pack or more of Warhounds, and Warhounds have no problem getting that close, even if you're using you know, a plasma blast gun or anything like that. So if I can get a little bit better results, oh. or if you can get close enough and then say you're using a um a Vulcan Mega Bolter plus one on the pen now um sorry on the armor rolls now actually gives me the ability to start chewing through different models. But no, I, I usually I didn't take much of the war gear. I didn't find I had the points for it or the desire. Like the plasma gargoyles were funny. Awful, but, but awful. funny. But they changed the plasma. Now you have the shit. Oh, yeah, sure. they don't even Come have on. plasma gargoyles Sh anymore. Shikarian yeah. conduits? Did I say that right? Oh, uh, oh GW. Yes, Shikarian? Shikarian conduits. Yeah. Conduits, I, would, yeah. I, would, I would say that's what it is. And that's, I mean, dude, hold on. The Titan. Oh. Yeah, it increases its yeah. boosted speed by two inches and its boosted maneuver by one. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I like that. I mean, sure. It decreases all the dice value of its weapons without the melee trait by one, but who gives a shit because you're going to be in melee. So now that Reaver's moving 11 inches? Ew. Yeah. Ew. And the idea is you're, you're only taking that on the models that, you know, you're, you're better in close combat. Not everything is going to be trying to do close combat. So you only take that on the one that you're actually planning on doing it with. I think that with some of the traitor stratagems means you could actually do a melee warlord. Where in the yeah, past, I was just gonna say, it was a terrible idea. So this is what I did during the event. I had a melee warlord, um, and I just warp display. I moved him first turn, move, moved. I did the uh, double move, and then I warp oh. displaced him to charge. But an extra two inches on the warlord, that's an eight-inch warlord. That's a 16-inch move. That's. And then I had a Gatling blaster on him, a power fist, and then I, I don't know what the hell I put on the top. Something cheap, because I knew I'd be in close range with Reavers, so I wasn't going to ever get shot. Yeah. But the Gatling Blaster, sure, it gets minus one penalty, right? Which kind of sucked for me, because Furians, within 12 inches, they don't get that ignore minus one. But with you, you just use the stupid, <laughs> you just use your uh, weapon skill. Yep. Which you've got, now, on them, it's not great, but you've made it one better. Yeah. Not not bad. And well, you're getting plus, plus minus one. Two. Yeah. You get minus two on the melee trait. Or minus yes. two, sorry, minus two on the uh, ballistic skill, which makes a Warlord five up anyway. Yeah, no, I, and, and depend, you know, the weapon you're swinging with, you know, you swing at the right rep and you're getting some bonuses there. So you're going to be hitting very, very well. You're not going to have a problem hitting them. That's a nice combo. I like that a lot. And and it helps <sighs> remove the uncertainty of the warp trait because, yeah, with that warp trait, like you said, oh, average is seven. You could roll double ones and go two inches. Now you're not or, doing anything. Or you could fall in the building. <clears throat> I've never done that. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. You could also hurt yourself horribly. So, I mean, getting the extra plus four means that you don't really care the number you roll on that die. Wait, 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 exactly. You use that warp jump later. You get a little bit of something that'll be more than enough. Now, what's funny, listeners, is you might be thinking, wow, this is a lot of variation. I'm liking this game. Well, hold your horses because there's... But wait, there's more, um, because we haven't even right, talked about you. strats yet. Now we're going to talk about strats a little bit later um, when we talk about like you know actual what the str different strats are, not like specifically, but just enough. But just the strats alone will also change how you play, and there's a lot of them. We'll talk about again. We'll talk about them later. Um, but even well, choosing let's different go through the strategies. Go yeah. Through the oh, sorry. So, okay. So I mean, that's what I put. I, you know, I'll skip it. I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll talk about stratagems. Let's so do it now. Yeah, yeah, so stratagems come in like different categories. So you have tricks and tactics, which are your uh, well, tricks and tactics. These are outflanking, which I know, Dave, that's your favorite with uh, oh, wow, Lancers. Yeah, uh, you have thermal mines. Um, so uh, much worse now. It's, a, it's still D3 strength. It's still hey. like they could make a difference yeah. in the game. Nope. I thought he lost because he more. didn't play his at the right time. Yeah, but like D3 strength... 10 hits on a Warhound? Ew. On the legs? Still do. Only strength 8 now. It's oh, it is only strength 8. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he was strength 8 because he was, a, he was a knight arm. Uh, you have range support. So this is your off-board artillery for damage or smoke or orbital lance bombardment. You have your battlefield assets, which are really cool now because since they've been plumped up. Because it used to be just bunkers or missile silos, which or like shield silos that help you reroll your shields. But now I think uh, you also get a uh, infantry Titan Hunter yes. infantry, which was a favorite during that um, 
during the game where he just kept putting his tank hunter infantry inside the shield of my my uh my um titans because they were in buildings but also like on the sides or rears so that strength four hit now became strength five or strength six which oh, that's a little more um and, and they cleaned up the rules which was important because the rules at yes, the beginning yes. were they were not well oh, done and it was very confusing what no, the intention was no yeah i agree um you have tertiary objectives which I find super interesting. Um, a lot of people don't like them. I actually do. So tertiary objectives are quite literally stratagem points that you spend on trying to get more victory points, which, which is how you win the game of Titanicus. They're very specific. They're usually very hard to get, and they cost some CP. It's two CP normally. Um, some are one CP, but they're, again, very hard. For example, one of them um, I used to take, one of my favorites was... Um, it was like headhunter decapitation where yeah. I would get <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because as Furion, I can target someone and ignore the minus two. I, it'd only be minus one. So I, that's a very good, you know, but it's an extra five or 10 VP. I couldn't remember. Um, but it's they only once five. and I have to kill the head. And it's very obvious by the way, when I have it, cause then I'm targeting the head, you know what I mean? But it's, I like it. Yeah. Well, they're all five of scaling what five VPs looks like. Um, a game it could be is like maybe in a high scoring game the winner's gonna have like fifty points tops. Yeah, and that's if they load them like up. Call it, I like to call it Sigmar. It's the Sigmar scoring, not forty k. It doesn't go up to a hundred. It's yeah. it's basically Sigmar scoring. Um, or to, to that point like bracket. Primary I say. could get you up to thirty. Your secondary yes. could get you five or ten. So your tertiary might, if you do really good and take like two of them, bump you to fifty. Yes. Um, Her series are good it's not for like, like little yeah. tiny steps either. It's like five points, 10 points, 15 points yeah. turned. So the math isn't too hard. But they're good. I like them. And they definitely like, I feel like they round out. Like, let's say you don't want anything. This is a good way place to get more VP if you feel like you're going to fail on something. Um, also, I mean, <sighs> tertiary objectives are great for like rounding out the rule book. Uh, missions. I found I use, and someone can agree with me or disagree, Steve or Dave. I found that I start taking tertiary objectives less when I play the open war cards, because the open war cards I feel are more balanced in terms of mission, primary objective, secondary objective than the actual rule book. That's, that's, I, I don't know. Know. Okay. Like that, with the that, rule book, I have. Okay. I think the I, I, is with the with the cards. You share a primary, we have different secondaries, as opposed to the rule book where they're, it's asymmetrical, which is a very fun way to play the game. The problem is they don't both, they don't scale evenly between the asymmetrical no, no. primaries. So like, that's where uh, Tertiary Engage and Destroy scales really nicely as you go up in points. But other one, like, because it's um, every time you kill something, you earn points based on how big it is. So in a bigger game, you have more stuff to kill. But then other ones, it's like, oh, yeah, if you manage to do this thing in turn one, in turn one only, you get 15 points. Congratulations. So, yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, yeah, a know, lot of those things they tell you are impossible. Missions. Yeah, so. exactly. So, yeah, no, it's, it's tertiary objectives are better for the rulebook. But once you play open word, we'll talk about that later. Um, you have tactical support. Um, this one was kind of weird. I felt like, okay, so it's got everything, but it's more supporty. So it's got the um, smoke that um range support have but it's more like supporty smoke like tracer cloud which you know you place it down and then you can re-roll hits whatever titan lands in that tracer cloud now before you get all scared of how op that is remember um stratums are played at the very beginning of the turn so you place that cloud down that titan is most likely going to move out of that cloud unless I don't know, something happens or whatever. Um, but you also have like veteran princeps, you have smoke screens there. These are these are your supporty stuff. Uh another favorite of mine, you have experimental warfare stratagems. So these are <laughs> these modify your weapons always at some sort of detriment. Um the person at the event had uh, oh, it basically my. Uh, the vortex it was a thing. Yeah, he did. No, no, no. He had the vortex uh, missile, which go ahead and explain. The what I found the other, uh, no, 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 no. But it was the vortex missile was one of them. But he also had. Hold, on, let me see if I can find this stupid thing. Uh, I can't find it. It was basically it makes your weapons um, 
get hot on a one, but they become strength plus two. Oh, the, ba- uh, the, the basic... For the, for the plasma um, you're talking about, right? Experimental. Yeah, they, it basically yeah. makes it... And he rolled it for the missile pod. So the missile pod had ten oh, shots yeah, of strength. Yeah. I was like, oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> ten strength um, six shot uh, missiles hurt. It's just called experimental war gear? I'm yeah, to it's... It. I think it- it's a warfare, experimental warfare. Um, it's not. I don't think it's in the main rulebook. I think that's more for loyalist and traitor. It was from the main rulebook. I'm not seeing it. Oh, it trailer. is? Oh, okay, then never mind. Yeah. Traitor book is at the very end. Um, and then, this is my actual favorite. All time. Love this category. Take it as much as I humanly can. Warp trickery. This is a traitor-only uh, stratagem or stratagem category, and <laughs> it's got my favorite one uh, that I've talked about all the time, Warp Displacement, which is literally your, your model, choose a line, and your model moves 2d6 in that direction. And hopefully just don't land on titans or don't land in buildings and stuff. Yeah, they also uh, wrote it so that you can't fall off the edge. Yeah. You can't fall off the edge, which is great. That, that didn't used to be in there, so that'd be... Oh, we've got some really interesting stuff, like... Um, are, uh, is it etheric? Etheric, etheric confusion, right? Etheric? Is that how you said? I'm going to say yeah, etheric. etheric. But essentially, um, the player chooses one of their titans, roll a d10 on the 3+, plus, immediately make up a repair roll for the titan, adding 2 to their servitor clade for that roll. Um, on a 2, the titan takes d3 devastating hits off the body. On a 1, the titan immediately suffers catastrophic damage. So, like I said, they all come with some sort of detriment, but if you roll that 3 up... A war warlord's rolling six dice for repair, which is at least, or yeah, not you including other things. With some of the mutations, yes, I think, right? some mutations. I didn't even talk about mutations yet. I didn't even mention that. <laughs> um, or like localized war storm. Like there's a, just a bunch of stuff. And then you have the loyalist version, which is desperate measures. Now I don't own the loyalist book, um, um, so go ahead and talk about desperate measures because I have no right. idea what they are. Yeah, so, lore-wise, the loyalists are on the back foot through the entire war, right? So, the best measures are basically like, hey, you're in a bad spot, go do that one last epic thing for your overrun. Um, so, for example, one of them is called, uh, this is one I really like, Sacrificial Lockup. Um, basically, what happens is you, you're like, hey, fire my coordinates, I'm going to die with taking them with me. You drop a blast marker over one of your models, and everything touched by it gets hit with some high strength hits. When you take D3 strength tens if it's um, just touching you, or 2D3 strength tens if it's over you. Um, so it hits hard. Um, there's one where you. I thought there was one where you run away. I feel like there's one where you run away. Um, basically. You can move out of arc at full speed, but I'm struggling to find it in the book. The long retreat, yep. Um, you know, because you're you know fighting this losing battle and you're falling back, um, you don't reduce your speed by half and going outside your front arc. So you can go backwards fast, go sideways fast. Um, EMP discharge, you overload your own shields to knock out your opponent's shields so that maybe one of your allies could get in there and just save the day, like... It's all like, oh no, I'm in trouble. Let me do this one final act. And it's fun. Um, I don't play them because I'm not a loyalist. I'm hashtag Team Black Shields. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's some cool stuff in there. Oh, that's cool. So those are your strategies. So like, and again, we're still on like just... This is how you vary your army. So again, so someone sits says to you, oh, it's only Imperial versus Imperial. It's it's not it's it's it is yes technically, but the amount of variation that you have in a single game is just absolutely insane, um, and it's just you can just and it, you can vary even your own legio you can vary by just taking the different stratagems or a different um, warlord trade. I mean, different warlord trade even we haven't mentioned that, but yeah, no, it's just the, the variation is amazing, um, and these are all things you do before the game even starts. You know what so I mean? How, this is how like, many this of these? Is, Cool, cool stratagems. Do you have? How many have I used, or how many do I oh, have? No, no, and uh, like in the game, you're not good at being led here, game. Dan. So, in other words, in a game, yeah. how many should I yeah. think that I would end up having? Oh, oh, um, there you go. So, normally in a game, you have five, um, five 
you SP. Five points to spend. Sorry. Yeah. You have five points to spend. Uh, the more ex- the the most expensive stratagem is a three. The least cheapest is one. I normally only have two stratagems because I usually take a three and a two. That's warp displacement, and then my Legio Furian stratagem, very specifically. But I've known to drop my Legio Furian stratagem, keep warp displacement, and then take another th- take three one pointers. So you, I mean, at maximum you'll have five. At minimum you'll have two. Well, okay, so you say five now. Oh, maybe they've changed this, uh, but do they still like have? If you, expensive. Yeah, do they still have? If you do not take a legio, that you get uh, two bonus stratagem points. Yes and no. Uh, Steve can explain this one a little bit better because yes, I, I, so, uh, yes, go ahead. It's one of the things that got stealth FAQ'd. So in the original oh. rule book, the way they put it is: if your opponent is running a Titan legio, for each. Um, set of legio rules they use you get to um strategy points to spend right so mm-hmm. i'm playing dan and dan says i'm going to use my rules for legio um periods because i think they're really cool and i like their benefits i go okay cool thank you for two strategy points right and it's like by the way i'm playing griffin he goes oh that's cool i'll take two strategy points and then we both end up with two extra points um because they were but they designed it, apparently, I read that they were thinking that people will go into, I think, one Titan from here, one Titan from there. A man yeah. must be identical. You know, reinforcement Titans can be different. Um, so they said, okay, okay, okay. We're going to dial it back a little. Now that we have a ton of Legio rules, you don't have too many points out there. Uh, and they made it the difference in the number of Legio rules you had per side. So if I had one and Dan had one, we got zero bonus uh, points to spend. So you indirectly gained two by your opponent having one and you having none, essentially. Mm. Um, but they revoked that FAQ in their latest update. So now it's back to the old, per Legio your opponent runs, you get two. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So, uh, so at yeah. 1750, it's three, commi- it's three CP, but because you're both basically playing Legios, it's it five. Goes up to five. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 basically it. Um so you'll have anywhere between two and 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 five. Um night oh sorry, I should mention if you're playing a night house. Yeah, you knights get, do their own thing entirely. They yeah. do their own I'll, thing entirely. This one, because I have to know this one. So you get your you know your three CPs for showing up to sorry, SPs for showing up to a fifteen hundred, seventeen fifty, that kind of range of games. Then, if your opponent's running Titans and has a Legio, you get another two, so you're up to five. But if you're playing Knights, you get another two for having a Seneschal, and then one per eye sire? Basically, you get one per Lance, and then an extra one on top of that for your first boss Lance, where your boss is. But if you upgrade your boss to the higher level boss, you get another one. So to translate that to something that makes more sense, um, if I run a knight army and I have one lance and I'm fighting a titan army with one legio, I'm going to have um, three for showing up, two for one for having a lance, one for the lance's boss. Sorry, one for the lance boss, one for the overall boss, and two for my opponent, putting me at seven. If I upgrade my boss, I'm going to have eight. If I take an extra lance, I'm going to have nine. And that's pretty much the extent of how far you can go, I think, with how chunky Lance's artifact into lists. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do want to make mention of this before we get to gameplay, um, mm-hmm. because the last variation, it doesn't seem like a variation, but it is. Uh, we're not going to go specifically into each one, because dear God in heaven, there are a lot. Um, weapons. <clears throat> Weapons will absolutely change again the way you play. And weapons kind of fall into three different categories. You have your high-strength, low-shot weapons. So these are weapons that kick out uh, armor. So these are your volcano cannons, your melta cannons. If they hit, they hurt. Um, You have your low-strength, high-shot weapons, which uh, basically are used to pick out shields. So these are your missile, your bolter weapons. Um... (laughs) I should mention, Steve's going to laugh, that there is Strength 3. Strength 3 does not hurt Void Shields at all. Um, yeah, it's a weird corner. Yeah, I think the, the only Strength 3 I know of... 
Yeah, I think it's the only strength um, three in the game. There's the Gatling yeah. on the Questorus, and there is the um, the Gatling on that one Sarasis class. Oh, the Sarasis, but it's the Gatling. It's yeah, the Knight Gatling. The Knight Gatling. Yeah, okay. They can so. fix that with certain rules combos, but yeah. At yeah, the base level, it's... they can't even knock out shields. And then you have the weird category. I like to call it the weird, because this is the... So they have usually medium shots, medium strength. They're, they're anywhere between, like, strength 6 to strength 8-ish. Um, they, this is, like, the weird category, and this is actually where most of the special rules kind of come in as well. So you have, like, plasma weapons, where they can become strength... They're strength 8, but they become strength 10, but on a roll of 1, they get hot. Um, increase your void track by one. You have Volkite, which is lower strength, but they automatically generate extra hits on the shield. Mm. Uh, you have your laser destructors and blasters, which are strength to eight, which is a good strength to be, but you can uh, hurt shields more as long as you roll a, a reactor die. So like, let's say my shields are three up to save. They become four up, which is really good. And then you have like flamers, which are just have their own template rules, which is just... Awesome. Auto hits. They just do three they're auto cool. hits. They're fun. Oh, yeah, they're great. So I just want to point out that even by changing your weapons, like if I take a Warlord with a Volcano Cannon, a Quake Cannon, and a Missile Launcher, that is extremely different from a, from a Warlord with a Plasma Gun, a Gatling Gun, and a Laser Blaster on the top. Two completely different units. Definitely. Another thing, too, is you have a kind of subcategory in there of Blast-type weapons. Um, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, so... The thing with blasts is if you hit your target and like so there's an inner ring and an outer ring of the blast, right? If your inner ring is wholly over your target's base, that blast counts as hitting it twice because it's in the center of the explosion. Anything else under the blast is hit once. Um, but the downside is they can't target specific locations. This is something we'll get into a little more later, but basically different locations are easier, harder damage, existing damage is there. Some weapons just don't have the accuracy to pick out a target spot. Like the Volcano Cat. It does amazing wholesale damage. It hits, it messes something up. But the problem is, it's not good for finishing off a target because it can't target what's already damaged. Exactly. Melee weapons always pick what they hit, and it makes them amazing. Yes, it does. Um... But that's that's literally like the pre not pre game, but that's your pre building army. Also, like pre game, I guess stuff that you do. Um, it seems like a lot. It really isn't. I know. Like, <laughs> I feel like we just talked for like twenty, thirty minutes well, on like everything you do before the game. But it's it's, it's like a lot of it is list once, building. A lot of that is it, yeah. most of that is all near list building, except for your stratagems, essentially. So just like any yeah. other war game, you may play. I'll, you've made a lot of decisions before you came to the table and the better you know a game the less overwhelming those decisions sound think of any game you've ever played when you first sit down the, the amount of choice or options does absolutely feel overwhelming when you learn it then you know what you're doing exactly so it, it sounds like a lot for everyone's left sitting but again the, the, this is the list building part of it which yeah. let's be honest who you know sit for hours on the, the battle scribe <laughs> planning out know, shit yeah, we'll, um, we'll do a separate episode at some point more about yeah. pure list yes, building. That we, what does yes. that mean? How to go through that process? And yes. as always, magnets did nothing wrong. Yes, please, Magnetize please. Your we mentioned this. <laughs> we God. said this in the first episode, but I'm going to say this now. Five by one, or I, uh, some are five by two. Five by yeah. one magnets. Warlords please, use yes. five by twos. Reavers and all all of that. That bit smaller. You, you usually get away with a little bit more five by ones. And um, some weapons, even on like the reavers, there, there's, there's tons of tutorials out there of how to magnetize your reavers. So like my reavers are fully magnetized. Not all their weapons come base magnetizable. Um, like the the power fist and all, you essentially have to sink a magnet in in its shoulder joint and then put a magnet in the end where it actually connects to. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find a few of the ones I used to use and link them in uh in in some notes on the show and all. And if not, I mean. There's yeah, a lot of research out there, but the big thing is so magnetizer much. stuff. Some of it, though, I will say, when you're looking at, um, especially for Reaver weapons, the Reaver is not as magnetizable as all the others. So for the Reaver, for a few of the weapons, like, um, hmm, trying to remember which ones off the top of my head, but a few of its weapons, you actually have to put the magnet inside before you glue the weapon together if you really want to do it well. Um, like for its, um, so it's I like little, um. 
I think for its it's a little it's turbo laser gun. I think that's oh, the name of it. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, tur- yeah. 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 So for those it. for those for those, it doesn't look weird. So um, you use a five by one magnet. It's you know it has like I'm gonna say it has a hook. It, it's not a hook, but it's like the gun has that little tray area. It doesn't have a sunken in hole. You can actually just kind of scrape up that area, put a magnet there. You don't have to drill anything. Glue it down, and it works perfectly. I mean, the arm is what, what would it be a millimeter small lower than it normally is, but it actually does work. Like you can literally just shove a magnet in that slot, um, even though it's not sunken in, and it still works a hundred percent. It does. I just don't like my magnets to show. So like with this Gatling blaster, before I assembled I the Gatling blaster, had it in two pieces. What I did was I, I took the magnet I wanted in there. I used, um, actually, usually use a bit of tin foil. actually. You could use green stuff if you have it. Um, I find for certain things like this, where the object is hanging fully down, that sometimes putting the amount of green stuff I need in adds too much weight. So what I do is I ball up a little tin foil. I put that in as the base. The magnet pretty much sits on that and it sits and then i'll glue it so that way it actually will touch the inside of the case because all this is inside of it but the tin foil is there to make sure that if the magnet were to start weakening on its holding point it actually can't go anywhere so it adds almost no weight and it gives a good connection point to it oh okay that 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 actually sounds pretty damn cool okay Mm -hmm. okay and i've been magnetizing stuff for a super long time so yeah. All right. I think I think we get to the meat of it. I think we we talk about the meats. Okay. Let's let's do it. Gameplay. So mm-hmm. I know we mentioned gameplay before in the first episode, but now we're actually going to go into the depth, like how you actually play the game. Yeah. Um. Um. And this is assuming you've done your lists, your warlord traits, everything. Realize that during the gameplay, some of this might change, either because of your warlord traits or your strats. But other than that. This is how the game is played. So the first phase of the game um, is usually my, it's actually my favorite, believe it or not, because it's all alternating, is the initiative phase. So basically, um, each player rolls a D10, and whoever has higher gets the, he can choose. Yep, who it's a choice in this has, game. Yes, it's, it's, you get to choose, which you might always be like, why don't I just go first? Sometimes you don't want to go first. Sometimes it actually makes sense to go second. Um, you choose who gets to go first in every phase thereafter. Um, I shall mention that in turn one, um, the person who finishes setting up first gets to roll a d10, and the other player gets to roll a d6. So there's more of an incentive to finish setting up first. Um, and, and to... Just because there's a variety of games out there, um, to clarify that other point a little bit, you are choosing who goes first, and that will, choice will stay the whole game. It is not a choice per per phase. Whatever you choose goes first, stays first. Well, yeah, for the, for the, the turn. Yeah. yeah, for, for the, the turn. Yeah, round. yeah. Game, well, yeah, yeah, buyer of the round, because the way you said it, it potentially could have been the other way, but they don't allow for that amount of um. Oh, I see. What you're yeah, so yeah. It's per... So, there's four rounds per the game, five rounds if you're lucky. Um, I think there could be a six round as well, but it's yes, very hard to get to. Um, but every round, there is a new, uh, possibly a new first player. Um, after your roll initiative, it's the strat phase, um, which, funny enough, Mr. Steven has actually told me that this actually does come before orders. Um, I did that. not know this. So that's yeah. that's why I love that's why I love having so so I'll get to you. so the strat phase is where you play your strats. Steve, Mostly, why is yeah. the strat phase why is well yeah ninety percent of them usually. Um why is the strat phase before the command phase? And I remember asking you this and you gave me a very good answer. Well, one of the really big reasons is because stratagems can change how you get orders, or if you play the box blackout stratagem, it just ends the phase and you don't get to have orders. Yep. I, I didn't realize. I thought it was played at the same time, but apparently no. Okay. So, and you do go back and forth. Again, with every no. one of these turns, you go no, alternate. I play a strat, you play a strat. I yes. play a strat, you play a strat. And things, um, not every strat is, I'm going to activate this card and do a crazy thing. Some of them, um, for example, in, the, in this part of the phase, 
is when your defense emplacements attack. If you bought like um, Apocalypse Missile Strong Points as one of your stratagems. So I guess it is a strategy, but it's not. So it also changes up the order of play a little bit because you're attacking outside of the usual attack sequences before your opponent gets to repair things. Um, and you also could repair things in this phase too. Um, well, not in the trap phase, but later on. Um, yeah, stratagems. Um, no, no, there are stratagems yeah. that let you repair. Yes, there are stratagems that let you repair. So I yeah, no. Earlier, yeah. Yeah. So this is the like so. This is where you play your strats. And I said 90% of your strats. Some strats, like, for example, the Legio Furion one, is played during the shooting, the combat phase. So there are some strats that don't get played during this phase, but a good portion do. And then you have the command phase. Um, Steve, go ahead, or Dave, which if you want to take this one. Um, yeah, I can go, I'll go through command phase. I'm actually fine with that. All right, so... For a command phase, again, the game is back and forth. So in this, whoever ends up being the first player is going to choose a, if they wish to issue any commands to their titans. A few things to realize. One, you don't actually have to issue any commands. So you can choose to skip it or anything like that. The other thing is in this back and forth, if you ever decide that you are done issuing orders to titans, then you cannot issue any more after that. So you can't wait to see what your opponent does or do one, see if they get something else, then try one later. Essentially, when it's your turn, you either issue an order or you're done with your orders. So I'll um, discuss the orders in a second, but essentially for... Actually, no, we'll go through the orders first. So for the orders that you can give, charge. So you choose one of them. Um, as it says, you give it the order to move, and then if it gets close enough, it can either do a melee attack or it can essentially shoulder check one of the titans. Actually, someone wants to take it for one second. Let me get my thing with the orders on it so that way I can actually go through them because there's downsides to each of while these as well. You're, you're not, absolutely. And actually, while you're getting your book, I will also mention that if you fail an order as well, you get um, done. You're done. You you cannot issue an order now. This goes back all the way to the beginning of the podcast when we said maniples do change your stuff. One of the very first maniples that everyone sees is the Axiom maniple. This is your is God. This the is the most general. Yeah, this is the most general maniple of all. It it has a warlord. It has a reaver. It has a warhound. It's got everything. I don't even think it has a knight position too as well. And the Axiom maniple is quite literally. If you fail an order, you can keep issuing orders. So it, it's, it's the most basic of the medals. Yes, aspect. very forgiving. But just realize if you fail, um, you be done. Yeah. <laughs> and going back to think about, you know, do I want to go first or second in any given turn? This is where you really have a big advantage in going second. Because you go, oh, you know, my opponent over there is, is going to first fire. Well, in that case, I'm going to respond by doing a charge or, you know, whatever sequencing of events you want to happen, you could kind of dictate what your opponent does when, if you could react to them in the command phase with your orders. The number of times I've psyched the opponent out by issuing a charge order I don't intend on actually charging with, too many times. Um, yeah. I've made my opponent play defensive and cagey with a Warhound um, squadron. It's like, oh no, that's a reaver over there. He's got a power fist. He's on charge orders. I'm going to hang back for a turn. And I didn't even charge. I sat where I was because the drawback of the charge is it restricts the way you can move. But you can still fight normally you to, in the fight phase. You have to move in a straight line or move yeah. within the arc of a straight line. That, that'll it's be different between fight. knights and titans because knights got a little abusive if you wanted to be a rules lawyer. They fixed yeah. it. No, they, no, yeah. All right, so so, All right, so, so we'll oh, go, sorry, we'll David. Not no, it's, yeah, yeah. I pulled out the book, and I know a little of this is FAQ, especially under the charge. So we'll make sure we throw that in there. So for charge, as it says, in the movement phase, a unit acting under charge order can only move within its front arc. So if you're a Titan, you have your arcs, you're moving your front arc, and once it starts moving, it cannot make any turns. However, once it finishes moving, it can immediately make a smash attack, which is essentially where you hit it with your body, not a particular weapon, or you can attack with a melee weapon. Um, you get now. I, I, this I know. I think is different from the way they they've changed it. So you get one to the attack's die value for each three full inches the model moves before attacking. Is what you know, is it they change the it to? Is that the same? 
Oh, because so, they so, changed it for Knights it, because Knights yeah, used to have it. Knights. Yes, it's, yeah, it's no, Knights sure. that got the problem. So the KG one, or not the KG, the, the what's the word I'm looking for? The, Rules that lawyer. guy, Rules yeah. Lawyer problem was that Knights thought because they had a 360 uh, line of sight on their base, mm-hmm. Because they could, you know, knights don't have an arc technically, yeah, so they want to charge. Their charge. front arc is a full three hundred and sixty degree. It's a full three hundred and sixty. But what what people thought, which is wrong, you is that I in place, it, exactly build up momentum you, and then just yeah, walk so, without actually so going you, anywhere. Yeah, it's it, it's really weird. Or my favorite was that they could move five, then move six in another direction, then move one. Because technically, since that's all of their front base, they can ang- they can they can. Angle like their charge the back and get exactly. The no, knights have to charge in a straight line. You cannot a single straight single. Line. Yes, single yeah. straight Which line. Means they can't go um, around corners. So if they're hiding one turn, they can't pound to the charge unless they're doing it yes. through their quarry comes around the corner. Yes, exactly. Uh, the other thing was the attacking thing. So knights yeah. still get one attack per three inches. That's fine. Knights it used to people used to think that. Each individual knight gets an additional attack per three inches. It's not that people used to think that. The rule was written in a, yes. in a particular way. The, the problem is they wrote the rule that they could, and then later they, they realized game, it was a problem. Added- exactly. Yeah. So it's basically you add an attack to the unit yeah. uh, per every three inches. So the way this works is, um, like, let's say, honestly, if the knight's all in the front arc, then no problem. Just add, like, if they each get two attacks and there's three knights, that's six attacks. And let's say they move six inches. That's plus one, plus one. So that's eight attacks done. Um, which, where it gets really pesky, but it's still easy to work out, is let's say you have one knight on the side and two in the front. So that's four attacks in the front, two in the side, and you can assign those two extra dice of the charge to whoever you want. So you can actually toss that on the side, if you will, if you want to. So you can have four on the side, four in the front. Um, there's like a pool of dice, essentially. Um, but that's essentially how they changed it, or they yeah. fact it, I guess. Be the... But yeah, that's, that's clarify that a Titan can turn before a charge as much as it wants, but once it starts moving, it can't. Yes, you can't uh, turn. You can charge. You read, oh, you can't turn. Oh no, I have to already be lined up. But you could turn at the start, and Titans can still zigzag. Um, but it's yes. gotta be the front. Line. So I did talk yeah. about this in the movement phase, but be, I know we're in the command phase. But I just want. People kind of, this is one of the biggest mistakes people do in Titanicus when they first start, is they think Titans can only move forward. Um, Titans have a front arc of 45 degrees? 45 off the center, so 90. Yeah, so 90 off the center, yeah. So, but like if you have, you'll have a movement tool that comes with the starter box. If you put that in the front of your base, you can, it's almost like, I, the way I imagine it is like old Battletech torso twisting, where it's, you're not moving only forward, you can move within that 45 degree forward so it's almost like your body's facing forward but your legs are rotating in that 45 degree angle to the side once you start moving outside of that arc that's where your movement gets you know cut or halved unless you're in another maniple um but you can move freely within that front arc so it's like a, you, you can wiggle within that front arc i and, like to move on my diagonals a lot because it gives me the speed without sacrificing my face yeah. So yeah, that's definitely something that people don't always click with. Yeah, it, it's 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 kind of hard to once you get it, it makes sense. It, it, it's it's again, imagine your Titan is torso twisting. It's the nicest way to eat. It's the easiest way to think of. All right. So next order then uh, that we have here, first fire. So it says when a unit is acting in first fire order in the movement phase, so it doesn't move or make turns, so it stays still. But instead, it picks one of its weapons and it attacks it with its full profile. Um, as this is always note that the attacking weapon must be declared before selecting a target. It does not prevent you from using that weapon in the combat phase. So you can pick one of your weapons and instead of moving, you get to fire it in the movement phase. And again, if you had the initiative, then you could actually fire before your opponent can react to you doing anything. Exactly. Now, the down drop turn is you can't move. I do want to point out the no turn thing. Technically, you can turn if you have a warlord trait. Um, and then again, this goes into the variants of the game. There's a specific warlord trait that allows your princeps to do one 45 degree turn before he does an attack. Since this does count as an attack, technically he can turn 45 be doing the, before doing the first fire. But that's, I think, the only time this book this comes up. I, I, I literally think. Yes, if you push your reactor, roll critical. 
lose control of your Titan. Yes. Maybe you could turn, but then also your attack ends. So that's yeah, like, so yeah, exactly. That that's that's got to really be hard. But yeah, no, it, yeah. yeah. I would say I would say in that you wouldn't even oh yeah I guess for the weapon you push your actor it could go bad yeah bellicosa oh, yeah. for example yeah 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 it, it's it's a, such an odd fringe but again these are two very odd fringe examples yep. so I'm just pointing that out all right yeah um, first so, fire is nice yeah yep <laughs> emergency repairs as soon as the issue order is issued you can make a repair roll you add one to each of the results on your dice and if you've been giving that. Um, if it's active in the movement phase, then it cannot activate in subsequent com uh, combat phase. So essentially, you can repair them immediately. You get a plus one on all the die rolls, but you either move in the movement phase or you sh or you attack in the combat phase. You cannot do both, and you do get to choose which. So you could, at least if you wanted, you could delay that particular Titan going towards the end of the movement phase to decide whether or not which one you really needed to do. Okay, yeah. All right. Uh, I should pop. point out. Go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. We'll talk more about this in the repair phase. But if your Titan is in the orange, bad stuff can happen. So this yep. is a good way to prevent that from happening. This and we'll talk about that about more. Now. Exactly. Yeah. So or we'll talk about that later. Anymore. Anymore. It's even more important there. <laughs> right. Split Next fire. Door. So, um, your Titans have a variety of guns. Unless you have split fire order, every gun goes at the same thing. Split fire lets you, now it says a unit acting under split fire orders cannot make any turns in the movement phase. But we already talked about this idea of when you're moving your front arc, there is actually a lot of movement. It's not necessarily a straight line. Same sort of facing, but you get a lot of variety there. And you go sideways here too. That is true, actually. Yeah, uh, you could just go purely turn. sideways. You can side shuffle at half speed or back up or whatever you have to do. You just can't you move know, sideways and halfway. Exactly. Yeah. It says, however, and just let the target step of the combat phase, a different target can be declared for each of the unit's weapons. I I like the idea of this one. I find I rarely have ever used it because you do you still have to declare all of your attacks before you actually start attacking with that Titan. So you mm -hmm. kind of have to know that you're gonna get something to happen. No, no, you attack per weapon. So you declare attack with a weapon, finish that weapon, then you declare attack with another weapon, then finish that weapon. You don't have to declare... Is, so you don't no, declare, no, no, that's titan, you declare one weapon at a time? I, yes, so I declare the Titan, but then the weapon happens one at a time. So hmm. the way I use Split Fire, I've been actually using it more and more, only because I've gotten, been getting a little bit... I use it with my Warlord. I'm so if I go... You, yeah, I don't think what? that's right. Combat sequence, step one is select target, step two is declare a weapon. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you're right on that. Split fire allows you to choose multiple yeah, targets for that weapon. But it breaks for, it for the Titan. But that doesn't mean you're choosing one after another. It means I think it's, I can I'm fire this shoot, gun here, that gun there. Model, this model, with that, with that, with that weapon, and then you resolve it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't agree with you, Dan. I think it's literally you choose. I'm going to ch target this Titan and this Titan. All right, I'm going to choose the yes. plasma gun. It is going to choose at this Titan. Finish and then that. Then you choose the other ready. guns. Mm hmm. I don't think so. We'll come back to this. Where's my I need my rule book on this one? I, I oh. think they either facted or they they changed. I, I feel like split fire is you can if actually, it's oh, different. Then they must have. Then uh, to me that would have been a fact because I don't think the base rules allow you to do that. I gotta look up the combat phase. I need my I need my rule book. <laughs> look up the FAQ while we're talking about this. I'll yeah, let me give me a second. All um, right. but yeah, go ahead. go to the next one. Yeah, yeah, go, go take a look at that. We'll talk about full stride. So, um, full stride is your order. Doesn't let you attack in the combat phase. Instead, when you activate that particular uh, model or unit, there's a chance that units, you can move a, a number of inches up to your speed. Has to be made in your front arc. Cannot make any turns before, during, or after this move. And the move must be made in a single straight line. So, essentially, you can move in the combat phase as well. So, this is how you get your Titans that need to be closer, or at least out uh, into cover to be able to move them more. Very useful, actually, especially like um, playing Volpa and something like that. When you look at your Reavers and things like that to actually be able to get them upfield. Or if you happen to have, say, a Warhound that you really need to get closer, because a lot of, not all the weapons, but a, a good amount of the uh, Warhound weapons that I like need to get closer. 
So a lot of times, say the first turn, their whole goal is just to start running up the board, usually trying to be in cover and all or not be seen, but running up. Um, while Dan finishes, uh, so, did you find it? No, I got So here's the weird, in typical FAQ fashion, it's okay. the replace following sentences and stuff. So, uh, hold on. Page 33, combat sequence summary box out. Add the following to the end of step six. You wish to attack with... I don't, um, that's probably not going to do anything. The combat sequence. The second paragraph should read, when a unit is activated, it may attack with all of its weapons following these steps. I don't know if that changes anything. That's the same. So they added that little bit, but that was it. They just added the that you wish. Yeah. So I think you have to declare the weapons first. Yeah. Let's do Step one is select target. Step two is declare weapons. Declare which weapons, weapons will attack. A weapon has not been disabled. Oh, sorry, disabled cannot make attacks. In my mind, if you're declaring the attacks, but you have more targets. Well, then, step one is what? select target, right? Yeah, select your targets. Okay. And is two, you choose an attacking weapon, then you go through that process. But in my mind. So that's well, so I'm right. Yeah. What? No? You, go ahead. Go ahead. The, the, the reason I have an issue with that is because what they're changing is the way that you enact step one, that you're allowed to make more than a choice. Um, different terms for each of the use weapons. I I would need something that tells me the that you can do it otherwise because. I would go to my rule of thumb where you always play an ambiguous rule the way that least benefits yourself. Yeah. So I always yeah. allocate so what the way where and then go with whatever my results are is what I'm stuck with. Well, so the way I understood it, because I'm reading the step by steps, so I have the book for me is step one, select target. Okay. You selected, I don't know, this warlord, right? Step two, shoot a weapon, not shoot all the weapons, select a weapon. So I'm shooting a plasma gun finish the plasma gun shots and then you go back to step one select a target if you're not under split fire then you must select the same target but if you're under split fire you can now select a different target select another weapon do that weapon because it, the, it the steps repeat itself does that make sense so it's, it's select a target fire a weapon and then rinse and repeat right Am I stupid? Am I reading this wrong? I'm reading it as you combine step one with a little bit of step two and you just allocate weapons to multiple See, things. Me, I think they're two different. So this is the, this is, oh, I hate bringing this up. This is, where I hate, this is where I bring up 40K. This is much better worded than 40K, in my opinion. This is why I'm thinking the split fire works the way I do it, because in 40K, you'd be completely right, Steve, that the two rules are, are combined in 40K, which leads to a bunch of problems. I think that this book does a very good job of differentiating step one and step two is step one. You select a target. Step two is you fire said weapon and finish it. If you're oh, not under split, split fire, fire overrides that base. It's, it's not that it overrides it is it allows you in step one, instead of choosing the same target over and over, over again, step one, it allows you to go back to step one and be like, all right, instead of shooting this warhound, I'm going to shoot this warlord instead. You, you've made the choices That's already the by the choice. time. You've already made the choices in step one. When you repeat your cycle, you only you only repeat steps two to five. You don't repeat step one. I don't think that necessarily changes this particular discussion, but you've you had to have declared yours in the very beginning. You've declared them and then you start shooting. So oh, then it'd be this is gonna be the weird part. So then what would I do? I'm selecting to target this warhound and this warlord. Then and you choose a weapon, finish it, then you choose another weapon, finish it, then you choose another weapon, finish it. It doesn't change the end result. It just changes weirdly how it's phrased. Does that make sense? Did I, did I, say, I don't know if I said that correctly. So like in step one, if you don't ever go back to step one, what split fire allows you to do is say, I'm going to target X, Y, and Z. Then you move to step two, select one weapon, finish that weapon, go back to step two, select another weapon. It may target one of those three targets. You were not able to select any of those targets if you didn't do split fire. Right? My, that problem is you declare it for each weapon. You're not declaring targets and allocating weapons. You're declaring targets for the weapon. Yes, yeah, so it's individual. It's a completely different step. That's how that's I, that's how I understood split fire to be. Otherwise, it's 
I would dare say split fire is almost completely useless because you literally cannot have foresight. The idea of split well, fire is, is you do it when yeah. you activate the Titans, when you allocate it. So, go, okay, yeah. well, this one has no shields. So I'm going to do my big cannon of doom on that. But that one has shields, so I guess my bolter that can't hurt this will go over there. It still has uses. I've used it um, a couple times, and it actually works decently. I, come, I would come back to this discussion, but yeah. I, I dare I, say I'm right on this one. Only because the way this we don't work. always get right. I just no, true. read yeah. full stride, and I... I haven't gotten this wrong. In the movement phase, you move totally normally. It's your second move that has the restrictions on it. Yeah. I'm going to say if it yes. keeps it. No, no, it's the second I move, yeah. I did not realize that. Oh, there we go. All right. I'm, 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 my I'm of two so minds much. of this. I do see how you're reading that, Dan. And, and, and yeah. I, I believe there's some support of that. But I would like to see them actually say that, yeah, you know, you can totally swap out as you go along. Because that's not so how only... I understood any exactly. of that. And maybe that's because normally, since you're only choosing one Titan, it literally has never mattered. And this is the, the one is only other... time it matters. But the only, um, for the anyone... Is I... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say the, only, the problem is I play other game systems, and I know how convoluted the shooting phase can be. And compared to other game systems, I feel like this one is more directly worded that you can actually select multiple targets before you fire versus something like 40K, which is... <sighs> it's 40k. Um, but the other reason I bring this up is because um, I, the, the the YouTube guys that I watch, um, they're really big into Titanicism. Now I'm literally forgetting their their name. Christ on a stick. Uh, tabletop Titans? No, 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 no. That's not them. That's 40k. Oh. No, they're, they're I want to say they're British. They're not actually British. Um, but they play it the same way I do, which is why I thought, which I know YouTube's not the best example of, you know. <laughs> Rules correct. Yeah, yeah, I've shared my thoughts in private with you on that once or twice. Yeah, exactly. But they're pretty, like, big on Titanic. Uh, Tabletop Standard, by the way, is their name. Tabletop Standard. Okay. Yes. Um, Good stuff. There. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. But they've done it that way. Because to me, it just makes sense. I don't know. But anyway, let, let me not I'm... keep talking about this. Yeah, go ahead. I'm coming around a little bit more to your way of thinking, but I would like to see something more official that says one way or yes. the other. Yes, um, I agree. And it, anyone, anyone listening or anything like that, I'll obviously put a, a post about this under the Reddit for Titanicus, which is a great resource, honestly. Um, and in there, I'm going to put in what way do people play it? Is there a, a good consensus? Because I even went back to the original GW article and they kind of just like, hey, let's just split some weapons. It would have been nice if they had said a little more than that. Articles on GW are never worth reading, though, because they get everything wrong every time. That's true as well. If you want a rules resource, do not use Warhammer Community. Um, (laughs) Go anywhere else. I'll point out, uh, they they got a bunch of the custodians rules wrong. Anyway, yeah, no. (laughs) Um, One last order, then. And I know know in, in the notes, Dan put, why would you do this order? Um, It's not necessarily you doing the order i would think oh, in yeah, this it's particular so one it gets inflicted on you more often than you follow yeah, yeah. So, but so you can't the, do it Not you can. so this is a shutdown order <laughs> if you know what void shields is issue shut down orders you collapse all your void shields if you're under the shutdown order you cannot be active in the movement phase or the combat phase reactor rolls cannot be made for a unit with shutdown orders even if you're told to do so shutdown orders are not automatically removed in the end phase so at the end of the round, all of your orders come off unless it was shut down order, and there's certain ones for for knights as well. Uh, you know they can get a essentially a shaken order. Um, a unit that has shut down orders at the end of the battle counts as destroyed. So if you're not up and running, you might as well just be dead at the end. Um, when activating a titan under shut down orders in the damage control phase, you reduce your reactor level by two before you repair it. Um, as mentioned, this is not an order you want to give yourself. Um, the, maybe if you're in red and you really yeah. want to keep your model alive, that's the and you're out of line of sight, and no one's going to yeah. see you. Yeah, if you have like a little warhound in the shields, back, you might not even react to the following phase unless you have yeah. some cool trick up your sleeve that's to change your orders, like a stratagem or leave you a rule. Yeah, it's mm. it's a bad spot to be. Yeah, uh, there's n- now. I think there's two ways you could end up in this involuntarily. 
There's the sabotage strategy where yep. you randomly issue an order by rolling the order dice, and whatever result you roll is what the target gets. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a one in six chance of shutting down with that. And then there is the Natrix Shot Blades, which is a cool bit of esoteric war gear from Forge World for the Warhound. And mm -hmm. it has a chance to issue shutdown, but that shutdown is only for that game turn. It automatically goes away, unlike the base level order. Am I missing any other ways that could happen? I thought there was a stratagem that issues a shutdown. Not a random roll, but I, I could be wrong on that. It's been a little bit since I've looked at them because there's a lot of stratagems. We're going to spend, like, yeah. honestly, it's going to be more than one episode just to talk about stratagems because there's so fucking many of these things. But I thought there was a stratagem that actually issued a shutdown order to someone. I think you had to, like, succeed on a die roll, but it wasn't a random roll of order. It was succeed on the die roll and you give them a shutdown. But I, I, I could be wrong on that. It's possible. It's definitely possible because... Honestly, there was a point where I was like, there's a lot of strategy. You're going to find the three that I like in each book and remember those and kind of yep. push the others to the side. Okay, so I used one of the beautiful apps that are out there for the game that has all the um, stratagems. Mm -hmm. There are 163 in total throughout the game. <laughs> Some are duplicates because yeah. knights have their own versions of the basic things for whatever reason. But yeah, across the game, there's 163 don't worry, it's not reactionary. If you find five you like and just stick to those five, it's not going to be to your detriment. Yes. Find find the ones that you enjoy. Don't worry about the rest. It's absolutely fine. Because some of those stratagems also, when they're listening, are, you know, Legio-specific stratagems. So you yes. won't even necessarily have that many choice. But you still have a choice of, like, if that's the number, you probably still have a choice of, like, near 100 of these things. Yeah, yeah, if I, if you take if you take out the Legio and um, Allegiance specific ones, so if take out Loyal, take out Trader, there's still like 83. Yeah, which is a lot. Yeah, that's so many stratagems. But um, so in order to issue one of these uh, orders that you're attempting to do, you roll a die versus your command value. You hit the number or better, you succeed. If you miss it, so if you fail. One, the order doesn't go off, so you don't get whatever cool thing you're trying to do. And two, you're done with orders. Orders are you either succeed or you cannot even attempt to issue any more after that. Now, again, there's certain things that break these rules, but on the base rules, at that point, you're done. Um, If it's your princeps doing it, they get, is it a plus two? It's a plus two. But I think that plus is supposed to base command value, right? Or is it for orders? I might be getting that wrong. Um, I, think it's, I think it's actually to command value but about the only time you really need it is for orders we're going crazy that is true yeah oh yeah you get it for you get it when you're trying to go crazy as well yeah so yeah if you're trying to keep yourself under control or do your orders um essentially the bigger the titan the easier it is to do orders on it so the smaller titans have more of a hard time if you have them in terms of units because warhounds can be units then they can get their their command value can be essentially um, when you have more titans, it'll get a little bit better for them. But yeah, so the bigger you are, the easier the, it is. Yeah, the, each additional titan getting the same order gives a plus one bonus for the squadrons. Yeah, as long as so you're in a squad. Normally that's up to a plus two on Warhounds if you have all three going on one order. Yeah. Which is helpful. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Basically, the order's difficulty is related to the stubbornness of the titans basically like their their <laughs> animus, their spirit the right spirit. yeah so spirit. um warhounds they're 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 the, they're, you know, they're the hounds right they are savage animals and they want to just get into grips and do their thing so they're kind of hard to control despite being the smaller titans whereas a warlord is like a refined duke of the battlefield and it drinking tea <laughs> exactly like they're they're in the cockpit just drinking their tea well i say old chap like they're they're refined. They are strong wills, but the princeps in them have even stronger wills. And then even some stratagems change what your um, command rating is. Um, yes. Think of veteran princeps. You improve your ability to control because your princeps yep. is a veteran. But if you have a great crusade titan, they've developed their own. Um, you know, they've developed their spirit more. Their AI, uh, it's not AI. That would be heresy. 
there a machine spirit has a personality. It knows what it wants to do. And it's going to disregard the princess's orders because it's like, listen, I've been on this crusade. I'm a titan from the old days. Let me do my thing. I know what to do. Um, and then I think the trade-off is if it goes crazy, it always does charge orders or something like that. Like, whatever it is, like, it's cool stuff. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's just a command phase. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's again, very, not complex, but it does have depth to it. What, what is it? it it's, it's a calm ocean. It's a, it's a good, nice, calm service, but it's deep as hell. Um, Honestly, of course, most of the time, I don't even take orders unless it, like, chain is like, yeah. I need this thing to happen. Exactly. Like, it's, it's, orders it's, is the most yeah. flexible gameplay. So if you're like, oh, orders are too much, you could just they limit you yeah, exactly, which is good gameplay. Like for my it's demo games, game. I always start by playing no orders. You're just moving your titans and fighting with them as normal. Yeah. And it's like, hey, you want to you know save yourself there? Well, I got good news for you. There's an order for that. Um, what's an order? That was just command. It's a movement phase. Movement phase is again. It's a very simple phase, but. It's a lot of depth to it. So the movement phase is very simple. You move your Titans back and forth. I move my Titan, you move your Titan, I move my Titan, you move your Titan, so on and so forth. Um, there's two interactions with this phase. Um, you can push to move, you can push the reactor of the Titan to move farther, or, and or, sorry, and or, you can push your Titan to maneuver, so to, to have more turns. So a good example of this one, let's use the Warhound, for example. Warhound moves eight inches, but you can push the Warhound to move 12 inches. You know, a Warhound has four turns. Oh, sorry. Whoa. Has three. Wait, three, three, base. three turns. Three turns. Moves up to five. Uh, but you can push it to have more turns, so on and so forth. The detriment to this is that you have to roll a reactor dice. Now, this, I know we mentioned this before, but now we're going to talk about it. <laughs> Um, oh, and I should say, you can move within the arc. We mentioned this before, too. You move within the arc of your 45 first degree angle. So, your reactor dice is what gives this game a little bit of the randomness, and it's actually kind of fun. So, the reactor die um, essentially has one blank side, one machine spirit side. Hold on, I gotta do math here. One blank, one machine <laughs> spirit, uh, two single heat, one double heat. Right. And so yep. you have a heat track on your Titan. Um, and, you know, so if you roll blank, congratulations. It's basically what we call three. Uh, if you roll one heat, you move it up by one. If you roll two heat, you move it up by two. If you roll the machine spirit, it's still a heat. So you just still increase track by one, but you have to take an immediate command check. If you pass, congratulations. It's just a heat. If you fail, you have to roll on a chart. And this chart is various. Um, some of it makes you, it forces your tight forces. This is not something you choose. It forces you to move your Titan forward. Uh, sometimes it makes you fire a weapon at the nearest enemy. Don't worry, not your friends. Sometimes it's just you sit there making an immediate repair roll because your Titan is super scared. Uh, so basically, it kind of, if you fail the command check, it could hurt you because you're not doing anything. Now, I will mention, since we've talked about variants, certain Legios and Mandibles completely fuck with the movement phase. So my Legio, for example, especially with reactor dies, sucks. <laughs> because I roll a machine spirit check, not just on a machine spirit, but on a blank die as well. So instead of it being one in six chance, it's every one in third chance, which is not great. <laughs> it ain't nothing for um, no, yeah, nothing's free for that. Uh, and then I know that the uh, Corsair Mandible, for example, since in the movement phase, a uh, Corsair Mandible um, is, has the ability to tab their Titans, move full distance backwards or sideways. They're just, they're just... They're just dancing all over the place. They're dancing all over the place. So there is, again, this goes into the variance, but that's your movement phase. The reason I say it's you know easy to learn but complex is this whole game is about movement uh there are arcs and weapons so the idea of movement moving out you know having someone move their warlord first and then moving out of the arc of their missiles very important because those missiles will hurt void shields um maybe baiting another enemy titan closer so that your other titan can come around the corner and hit them on the side um the movement phase is extremely important uh for this game uh you two want to add anything because that's that's really the movement phase in a, in a nutshell but you know there's again there's the depth of the ocean with this this is where most of the thinking happens for me when i'm playing 
Um, basically, I'm trying to bait my opponent into exposing themselves. To, basically, I'm like, hey, look at this model. You want to kill this, right? Like, oh, for, like kind of visible. Like, all right, let me maneuver to get a good shot lined up. And I'm like, ah, I gotcha. And so they also, you know, pop out from some unexpected quarter. Like, guess what? I got a new target lined up. Um, yeah. I feel like a lot of the f um, tactical gameplay comes in with the movement phase and what you move where, when. Um, I, I, yeah, I I agree with all of that. I'm I, I'm still looking through random things to try to validate either of our thoughts on Splitfire. Um, no, I agree with all of that. It's this is probably one of the the most critical decision points in the game because since you care about your arcs, not only for your weapons but for your opponents and all, and what they're attempting to do to you, if you find yourself out of position for either you to be able to shoot or them to shoot you, that's when you're going to get into a lot of trouble. This is a spot where you are essentially going to make the decisions of what's going to happen really in the next round, which is you know, arguably the round where you want to be making your good decisions because that's an when you're actually fighting some of these people. Well, okay, after your repair, but then you get to fight them. Yep, and this game, this phase also plays a lot to the balance between different Titan classes. Like I said in the last episode, Warhounds are very maneuverable, so you could redeploy them very easily. Warlords are not. They are cumbersome. They get a base oh, yeah. turn of one. I think they boost for two. Dan, is that right? Yes, yes they boost for two. That is sad. Um, now again... So, Stratagems and Legios can screw around with this. Yeah. Um, but, Dan, you were not prepared for that the other day, were you? Yeah, no, no. It, that, a a warhound war came me. up behind him, and a warhound yep. took out a warlord in the span of two turns? Because uh, yes. it was able to maneuver around it. So movement phase... Uh, three turns, three where, turns. Three turns? Three turns yeah. Okay. Movement phase is what can make or break you in a game. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, but that's good. That's good game yeah. design. Yes. That's a good game. That's a good I game. I love design. based gameplay, which is another reason why I absolutely love this game. Yes. Uh, um, damn. <laughs> I'll do th this. Is there's a joke? <laughs> My titans are always in the orange. Um. So before the combat phase, you have the repair phase. So this is a cool phase where basically your servitors are clay <laughs> you're they're clinging inside the robot trying to put out fires trying to do it so basically you have a servitor clade so you roll the amount of d6 uh that is your servitor clade so warhounds have two uh reavers have three war bringers have four i want to say four yeah it's four I, I, yeah uh, big warlords have four. four and war masters not even know because i haven't played mine yet probably five it's probably something nuts oh, um but essentially on these D6 uh, will mean certain things. So on a four plus, you heal the heat. So you can heal, take off uh, one of the track for every four plus you use. On a five plus, it can heal a crit or a shield pip. And if your shield is completely dead, it can only be restarted on a six. Um, and this is where Dave was talking about um, the emergency repair roll because the emergency repair roll gives you a plus one on this roll. So now it's a three plus heals heat Four plus is a heal crit or shield, and a five plus repart start shield. Um, and which then brings extra repair roll as well. So yes. you get to do the emergency repair and normal and repair, repair at your base yeah. level. Doesn't get the plus yes. ones on the normal repair, but which then it, brings it me helpful. to my favorite thing, and I think Steven's favorite thing too: the death spiral. Yeah. Um, let's okay. So normally you repair it's everything. However. If your Titan is in the orange or the red track, immediately before you repair the Titan, this is before you repair. This is why I said emergency repair is good for this. Before you repair the Titan, you must roll on a table. It is all bad. Um, even though you, you normally think the one result is not like not bad, it is all bad. On a if you're orange, you roll a d6 on the table. If you're red, you roll a d10. And it ranges from the one result being a strength nine hit to the body, which is still bad. Which can I think do you, a critical damage. Yes, it's it, 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 bad. We're good. It can do, d3 strength hits on the body, strength nine hits. It can it can just burn out your void shields automatically. Let's say you had full voids in your orange. Well, too bad. No void shields. 
Which, by the way, you might be saying, oh, but thank God my void's already gone. It doesn't hurt me. Nope. If your, void shields are gone, yeah, if your void shields are gone and you roll this on the heat table, you just take D3 strength 9 hits. You can't escape it. And then if you get higher and higher, it gets worse and worse. And obviously the 10 result is you're just gone. Yep. <laughs> you just go nuclear. Um, the, the joke of this is one of the Furian stratagems is they can fire an additional weapon for an additional heat. So... I try to cool them down as much as possible, but almost always by turn three, turn two, they're in the orange-ish or y- high yellows. Um, but yeah, you guys want to talk about the orange or red? T- I've I've managed to orange and red my titans at least every game. What about you guys? No, I, run, I usually run pretty well. I usually don't run into too much of an issue with that because I have, I have seen people roll the ten and also no, I, I try to be careful. Orange is. Orange is one thing you can get by with orange. You, it, it's it's probably not going to end your day. It could, but it's probably not. The red absolutely will. You're gonna go red the first time. You're gonna roll a ten, then you're just done. And the war master is actually six servitor claves. Okay, so I was okay. Yeah. Six. I don't know. Steve? Man. The number of times I've killed a titan without it ever being targeted by enemy attacks should. Let you know that one, I like to play dangerously, but two, this table can be scary. Yes. Um, Warhounds are terrifying thing because their body to do any damage just don't roll a one, right? But then if you roll a five or a six, um, if you take the hits to the body, roll a five or a six, that'll critically damage your warhound on the body. And one critical damage on your body means that you start having a reactor leak which gives you more heat, which starts the death spiral. Um, so, and the uh, Warhounds only have two server clades, so you have two dice, hoping you get enough four-ups to clear the heat, but also that five-up to clear the um, critical damage. So it gets, it gets bad. They cook. They cook hard. Yeah, but that's the repair. It's, again, simple, but again... And then... Ladies and gentlemen, what you want to hear about, the combat phase. <sighs> the combat phase, what do we talk about? Right. I mean, so, so, so the combat but, phase... Before you get to combat phase... Oh, oh, let's, what I do? What well, I no, 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 not that. Let's take a look oh. at the time that we're at here. Because we're actually uh, crossing the two-hour mark at this point, And you're about to start oh, combat. Um, to me... Um, Perhaps this is a good spot to, to to call the conversation for a bit, because then what we could do in the next one is we can actually do a full in depth with, say, combat phase and all. Unless you want to go through it somewhat quickly, but oh, that's actually not a bad idea. That could be our episode three, talking about the different weapon. We could actually specifically talk about the weapons, because that'll take us some time, and then the overall sides we play. Yeah, no, that's a, I like that idea. Yeah, because I, I don't. To do it justice beyond this is the part when you shoot, it's going to take time obviously to go through, and that that time might go rather might go rather long. And uh, oh, I agree completely. And we do love this game enough to give it its 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 due. Yeah, and I, and that's absolutely fine. I think it's more important to give it its due, and you know rather than say say something short now and the next time be like okay well forget what we just said we're going to talk more about it now like yeah you don't just shoot here's the other stuff you do so um that's my sort of thought on it i agree i agree 100 percent. i like that all right very good um so this this intro so i i always i'm i think i said this last time i write the show notes normally then i let i let these two these two add it and the notes got longer and longer and longer. And I still had this idea in my mind. Now, we'll get through it in one. It'll be fine. We didn't even get through it in two. But that's okay. So what, what, we'll, what we'll do next time is we will start with combat phase. We'll go through all of that. We'll discuss what other things that we have. Um, we'll have uh, both Dan and Steve finally get a chance to talk about the uh, games that they've been playing lately in Titanicus. We kind of wanted to delay that until we got to a good understanding for anyone who is new. Um, so we will make sure we actually get to that. Um, I don't know if that'll be the episode for the week after. Um, actually, it might be. Might, we might try for the week after. What One other one I want to do before the year's kind of out is a year in review. Um, just talking about from the various systems that we do or, or big things that have happened in the hobby across the last year. But we could even do that when the new year rolls around. 
but um i i promise next time we will finish our intro that way in the future then we can talk about other nice little selected topics but we'll get through our introduction by next time <laughs> has then sooner or later um yep i agree yeah so All i right, do want to thank everyone who listens um the the listenership has gone up quite well and i i do thank everyone for that um in the new year when i actually have some more time because i'm off of work you know i want to put together like a facebook page and all that sort of stuff i just haven't any time to do that and i'd rather you know kind of have some episodes under our belt start getting advertisement out and then do that so i'm going to do that as well but in the meantime if you wish to reach out especially for site titanicus um, I'm always going to post this on the subreddit for it and all. The other good way to reach out is through um, the email. It's trainkickersnj at gmail.com. And in the new year, we'll have the Facebook page and all those sorts of um, other avenues to reach out. Um, it gives you an idea of what we're going to do next. Like I said, I'm not sure the order of those episodes, but you'll be able to see at least by title. Um, anything else, gentlemen, before we uh, before we close it out? No. I'm good. It's big stompy robots. <laughs> <laughs> all right. On behalf of everyone, I say I want to thank everyone for listening, and we will see you all next time.